Welcome, my friends, to another YouTube version of the BJJ Brick Podcast. I hope you enjoy the show, and if you do, please subscribe to the channel. So here we go. Thank you for listening to the BJJ Brick Podcast. We'll be bringing you Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and good times. We hope to flatten your Jiu-Jitsu learning curve, help you get the most out of your grappling ability, and meet your goals both on and off the mat. Welcome back, my friends, to episode 187 of the BJJ Brick Podcast. I'm Gary. I'm here with Byron today. How are you, Byron? Gary, doing great, man. Excited to bring this episode 187. We have Greg Thompson on the show. Uh, Greg is, uh, he trains special operations uh, people. He trains law enforcement. And he also, uh, he shares some stories and, and really shares a lot of advice about like real world self-defense and uh, kind of exposes, um, you know, like, you know, if you're just straight up, you're just a person, hey, think about this while you're rolling to help you uh, in case of self-defense or maybe try this training, uh, you know, this drill to get to prepare yourself for if you have to deal with a weapon. A lot of stuff in this interview. This isn't our typical, like, this guy's won a bunch of world champions. Here's his interview. This uh you know, Greg has been, you know, deep in the world of defending yourself and, uh, you know, dealing with special operations and, and that sort of things. And uh, that's where he's coming from. Really fascinating interview for me. So I was glad to get him out here. A little bit longer of an interview, but uh, I think you're going to love it, guys. Yeah, definitely. I do not miss this. A, a lot of good uh, advice here coming from Greg today. Speaking of good advice, the best advice I can give you besides <laughs> take your vitamins and train jujitsu is to get on our email list. We have a link to it on the show notes. This way, you'll never miss a show. Each and every week, uh, you'll get uh, our show notes delivered hot and fresh to you right into your inbox. So definitely get on our email list. Yep. The best advice I could give you uh, to brush your teeth and eat your vegetables every day, kids. Uh, But I do have some more advice. If you're in your first year of grappling uh, and and you're looking for a little bit of help, I have an audio book. It's about two hours and 30 minutes. It's going to help you from everything from finding the right gym for you, your first month of training, you know, kind of what to expect during that uh, really difficult month. Uh, I explain uh, some of the key positions and really the the positions and techniques to focus on a lot. And also another big chapter is uh, getting jiu-jitsu to fit into your schedule. And that's one that's often overlooked. Yeah, I'm going to jiu-jitsu. It's great. In reality, you've got work, you've got family, school, a lot of things you're juggling. How to get jiu-jitsu to fit in your schedule is an often underlooked, is an often overlooked thing that if you don't kind of think about that ahead of time, you, it might get pushed to the side. And then, you know, when it's on the side, it may never come back into the uh, to the middle. So check out the audiobook. Your first year at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it's 1199. There'll be a link to it in the show notes. Gary, I've got an interesting quote. You know, this is kind of a kind of a self defense episode, so I figured, hey, I'll, I'll find a quote that has something to do with self defense, and we'll talk about it. Uh, this is by Rory Miller. Uh, his first name is called R O R Y, uh, and the quote is: "No intelligent man has ever lost a fight to someone who said, and then quote within the quote, i 'I'm going to kick your ass.' So, what does that mean? If somebody says that they're going to beat you up, you shouldn't lose that fight." Because they're not beating you up right now. So you have a couple options. You could find a way to guarantee that you win a fight with that person. You could find a way to get out of a fight with that person. You could leave. You could, you know, get a bunch of buddies. You could get for help. You could find a, you know, some, a police officer. You can find your training partner. You can find Gary if he's nearby. Uh, all those will pretty much put the odds in your favor of not getting beat up. Um, so basically, if someone's threatening you and they're not actually fighting you yet, you shouldn't lose that fight. You need to uh, respond to that in an intelligent way. And so when I read that, here it is again. No intelligent man has ever lost a fight to somebody who said, I'm going to kick your ass. They're giving you a warning. Take that warning and, uh, you know, get prepare yourself and don't lose that sort of a, a fight if you're going to be in one. Uh, but better off, avoid the whole thing to begin with. Gary, does that make sense to you? It does now. I really didn't know where what it meant and uh before we went on air i told byron i have no clue what this means and i'll have byron talk about it but yeah that does make sense um you know hey some big guy gets right up my face says he's gonna kick my butt hey i can run i he hasn't started beating me up yet i can uh, pull guard uh no that's just kidding i'm not gonna do that but 
but you you do have a, a chance to do something unless he says I'm going to kick your butt. And the minute he says "but," he th- already throws that first punch. But you know, if somebody's coming at me with a you know angry, I'm not going to have my hands in my pocket. I'm going to leave distance. Uh, I'm going to create distance between between ourselves. So, you know, in case that conflict does start, um, you know, I'm going to be aware of my surroundings and uh, um, kind of know what's going on there. Exactly right. So I, th- I think this just goes to, you know, no intelligent man or woman or person has ever lost a fight with somebody who said that to them. Um, you know, you got to use your brain before the fight actually happens. So if someone's threatening violence, wake up, you know, don't just, ah, I train, I'll be fine. Uh, it's better off not even happening. You know, you, you'll avoid a lot of trouble if, you, if you're at, you know, a social gathering and someone's threatening you, you know, see you later. You know, take that. Yeah, a little bit of a hit to the ego and potentially, you know, save yourself from getting damaged, save yourself from actually having to damage somebody and hurt somebody. And, uh, yeah, it's just avoid that situation if at all possible. And if you can't, if someone's telling you that and, and you've got a chance to get, as you'll hear about during the uh, interview, a force multiplier, something that will help you greatly, like a tool or a weapon, uh, you know, prepare a force multiplier and get ready to go if it's inevitable. But uh, that, that'll be a little bit further on in the interview. But, yeah you're smart about it which you should be because you're smart and you're trained to suit you're also listening to the podcast so uh, we want you to be prepared uh, so if you hear those words you shouldn't get beat up you should be ready or you should be uh, out of there or get your force multiplier rolling or get the best thing is that you got to text gary uh, or call him and get him over there as quick as possible yeah, like I know one thing like Byron does is, you know, he carries pepper spray everywhere he goes. And, you know, I know you've used it numerous times and uh, it's really helped you out of situations. Yeah, I mean, I got to cross the street at the children's crosswalk. A lot of those kids, they're just like mean mugging me, Gary. Yep. But uh, yeah, actually, it's you're, you're teasing me. But uh, I do when I jog and I have my dog, I'm rhyming here, Gary. So uh, give me some uh, space for the airy. Uh, but when I when I'm jogging with my dog, I have a thing of pepper spray attached to the leash. So a oh, I one. I do got your force art. multiplier. I got it right there, man. I don't want to be in a fight, but if I am, I don't want it to be a fair fight. You know, my dog is not a large dog; it's a medium sized dog. But I know the dog's in on the fight as well. Uh, I'm gonna get the person with the pepper spray, and we're gonna try to get the heck out of there. Uh, so I've got a lot going for me if something does happen. But that all be all that being said. I'm not running where I should not run. I'm not running in, in violent, violent neighborhoods. I'm not running at times of day where I'm likely to be attacked. And, uh, and you know, that I, I, Andy, I got those things going for me too. Andy runs in his rash guard. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of people figure he trains uh, just because he's wearing a rash guard. So that helps a lot too. Yeah, there you go. Just kind of scare him yep. off to begin with. That's <laughs> kind of my strategy about dealing with uh, attackers while I'm out exercising in the public, Gary. But, uh, yep. It, yeah, I, I like that. Good piece of information, Byron. You're keeping the world safe. <laughs> well, at least my world anyway. But uh, yeah. we'll learn more about that in the interview. So here is Greg Thompson. He is the most interesting grappler in the world. If you catch him in an armbar, don't forget to pry open his fist after he taps. There will be a small piece of paper with your fortune on it. And it's always correct. When he was a white belt, he put a small amount of glitter on his belt and then went on a world tour. If you look closely at your key, you will probably find a few specks of glitter. He got you too, my friend. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I prefer the BJJ Brick podcast. Stay sweaty, my friends. All right, my friends, I'm happy to bring Greg Thompson to the BJJ Brick Podcast. Greg, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, really excited. We have, I always like getting different perspectives about uh, Jiu Jitsu and martial arts, and you're definitely going to bring that to the show today. Could you kind of just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and kind of who is Greg Thompson and, and where you are and what you're doing? Well, Greg Thompson like a lot of people have evolved over the years i started off in the in the martial arts when i was a little kid probably eight or nine years old doing traditional karate and then gone to taekwondo and um you know i'm 49 now so that was back in the 70s that, that was pretty much all you had everywhere was taekwondo and karate was kind of the the thing 
So I started off in that journey and then got into wrestling. I can remember even my Taekwondo instructor, he didn't want me to leave and, and start grappling. Um, he'd actually, uh, uh, right when I was going to leave, I was, I was really close to getting my black belt. I was like, you know, six months from being a, you know, a 12 year old black belt. And, uh, I eventually went back and got my black belt, but I wanted to wrestle. I just loved wrestling. And I remember this grown man going, well, show me what you do in wrestling. And I'm like, well, I got down on my hands and knees, like, Hey, we would start in this position. And he was physically pushing me down and trying to, you know, twist me up and saying, Hey, you see that doesn't work. You need to, you need to break contact. You need to strike. And, and I looked at him like, Hey, Hey, I get it. I said, I just want to be able to do both. I just like grappling and I want to do, I want to do the Taekwondo as well. Um, so then I, you know, wrestled in, uh, in junior high, did some wrestling in high school, you know, played football, still was doing my martial arts, but I was also training a lot on the heavy bag, uh, as well, kind of mixing it up. And then, uh, went and played college football at Western Carolina, did some intramural wrestling there, uh, and then followed uh, more into Thai boxing, got really into Thai boxing, where my Thai boxing coach was a pro boxer, and then we would mix other stuff into it, from stick and blade work to some basic judo. Um, then went on to grad school at NC State, got a master's degree in industrial design, but while I was there, um, you know, I watched the first, you know, I was in Raleigh, I, I watched uh, first UFC in 93 and I saw, and I remember I was so freaking poor back then. I was like, I've never paid for a pay-per-view. I'm in a little bitty apartment, you know, yeah, living on peanut butter and, you know, and, um, and just barely getting by. But I remember thinking, man, I've got to watch this. This preview look real. I hope it's not fake wrestling. So I remember paying, you know, this crazy amount of money. And then I saw Hoist. They were really fighting. I called my buddies up. I'm like, dude, you got to check this out. They're really fighting on TV. I can't believe it. This is real fighting. And watched and saw what Hoist was doing. I was like, man, that's the missing link. Because I remember fighting as, as a youth coming up. And I did some time bouncing and mixing it up quite a bit. And I would always end up, you know, taking people down and usually striking them on the way up or doing something, you know, with that regard and but when i was watching horse i'm like man that that's the stuff and i remember you know back then they had what was called uh the only thing that was out were the inaction takes which some of the older guys can probably remember there was these two inaction takes and they basically showed the gracie family fighting different people in brazil no rules fights it was just back-to-back challenge matches over and over again and there wasn't youtube back then i mean you had a dvd and you had a you know dvd player and, and information didn't get transferred like it does now, you know? Yeah. Um, that's, uh, it was totally different era. So I remember getting that and then, uh, getting the, uh, the Gracie basics. And I remember I didn't have enough money for that. I had to talk four of my friends to go in with me. We, uh, I, I bought it for like a, a 110 bucks. And then I was like, Hey man, I'll make copies of it for you. I figured I'd take a piece of tape and put it over the, the DVD thing, you could, you could put two DVDs together. And, yeah. and I would splice this stuff up. Some people don't have a clue of what I'm talking about. I mean, my daughter doesn't even know what a DVD is. She picked it up and was like, what's this? You a, know? a VHS so or a... You, it, was, it was just a... I'm, I'm sorry, VHS. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a VHS. It was VHS. And um, so I spliced, spliced it, uh, went to splice together, and it wouldn't work. I was like, crap, what am I going to do? So I took a 27-inch... TV and I <laughs> uh, took a video camera, cut off all the lights, and was recording it. Right, and you could hear the ice maker in the background. Yeah. It went while, while I remember made, made this dub, made this master copy, gave it to my four friends, you know, to pay them back for the twenty bucks they all gave me. And my buddy was watching, like, "What's that noise in the background?" I'm like, "That's that's the ice maker." And he was like, "What?" I'm like, "I had to explain to him the, the links that I went to to make these copies and just." put this information out and the reason i'm even bringing that up is you know with youtube like it is now in the, in the information age it's so easy you can pick something up and just get so much information so fast but back then i mean to get you know anything you know like hey here's an americana here's a camorra it was like whoa what is that you know and, and you didn't have ways to really pass information so uh did that and started training quite a bit and um 
got introduced to uh, some of the guys uh, in, in Fort Bragg that were trained, that was bringing the Gracies down before even the UFC started. Horse was coming out here uh, working with some guys. And um, Norm Hooten and a guy named Paul Hines were, were training with Hoist. They were uh, SF soldiers. And then I got become pretty good friends with Norm. And they did a team trip out to Torrance, California. Went out there with them and um, ended up getting my blue belt, came back, opened up a Hoist. Uh, or actually, back at that time, it was a Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Network. Um, and I was a blue belt, you know, so this was early nineties time frame. And, and back then to be a blue belt, there was only at that time, there was only three blue belts in North Carolina Wow! and, um, put things in perspective, you know? And, uh, so I had this school and I remember guys coming in, you know, basically challenging us, you know, and they didn't realize that I, like these guys didn't realize that I had a, a Thai boxing a boxing background, a taekwondo, a karate, or, or a wrestle like I did, I would just put on my blue belt. So they'd come in thinking I was just the blue belt, and they would take the course, and then they'd want to get, you know, want to roll real hard or, you know, add other stuff to it. And we'd end up smashing guys and just sending them away, you know, all the time. It was just a day-in and day-out thing for, for you know, around there. And then the progression, you know, then – my main focus then was, you know, MMA, you know, UFC was out in North Carolina. There was something called the, the gladiator law, gladiator law came into effect. Um, after the big show in Charlotte where they had the UFC there where it was banned. So we would fight in Virginia and I had a buddy of mine, Brent Pierce. We uh, put together a team called team rock. So, um, we started fighting, you know, Virginia, Georgia, all you know, up and down the East Coast, uh, put together a pretty good team. And we would mix up the classes. I had one night a week when I started teaching that was great jiu-jitsu, and another night was striking. And that was what we did in the 90s, you know, um, wrestling. And I was good friends with Coach Claire Anderson. Um, we're pretty good friends. I mean, uh, he liked to do uh, learn submissions. So I trained with uh, the Duke wrestling team a little bit. And then all the guys on the wrestling team, you know, I told them they could train for free at my gym just so my guys could get a feel for a wrestler and that work ethic and that grind, you know. So we had more of a meathead fighter type gym, you know, which we probably only had 30 guys and we would just smash each other every night. You know, we we learned over the years how to, how to train a little bit better. Um, but after that period, I would float back and forth to Fort Bragg, started working with some units in, uh, in 98 is when I first started working with the SF community. And the focus then was more just fighting in general. Um, 9-11 hit. Some of the guys that I had relationships with in the SF community were hired to train the air marshals right after 9-11. So they said, hey, we need some guys that were more experienced and well-rounded you know, fighting. I was pulled in. At that time, they probably had a, you know, probably 10 guys or so with different martial artists would float in and out. After a period of time, they, they kept a handful of us. We started developing uh, what was called the Air Marshal uh, Combata Program, which the first couple months after 9-11, they wanted to train the Air Marshals to a, a really high level, but they couldn't get enough of them up in the, in the sky, you know, fast enough so they said hey you're going to get this training back at your hubs but the program that we had created for the first couple months was pretty pretty special i mean we would they brought in some of the best edge weapon guys and we would start fighting in confined spaces i remember saying hey you know i don't like teaching certain techniques because i don't think they're going to work in the aircraft so they had aircraft for us, and me and a, a, this one guy, he was a, a collegiate wrestler, and another guy was a purple belt, really big guys. Three of us got on this aircraft, and we spent two days just beating the snot out of each other, trying different techniques out under under stress inside the aircraft. And it was a little can because there weren't people on there, but you know we developed um, some good TTPs, tactics, and pr procedures for fighting in the aisleways and fighting around objects and realizing when certain points happen that it's going to be really hard to recover from, that you cannot let certain people get in certain spots. Or even if you are a better 
at jujitsu MMA or, or martial arts or an athlete that you're going to be behind the curve on. You're not probably going to recover fast enough. So we developed some techniques for that. A lot of that got pushed to the, to the wayside, you know, months later uh, because of time. They just wanted guys to go through the basic fletchy, you know, cookie cutter, this is a pair of handcuffs type training. And then when they went back to what's called their hubs, which is local places, they would get more training in that. But um, after that training, they had asked a few of us to stay behind. You know, me and about four other guys were asked to become defensive tactics instructors. Um, so I'm one of only a few guys that are, I've got a certificate that says I'm a federal defensive tactics instructor, and I'm not even a federal agent. So um, we stayed there for about a year in Artesia, New Mexico, you know, teaching basic stuff. The reason I mean, you know, going in that really helped teach me a lot about what law enforcement officers need and relating that to self-defense, adding, uh, helping me have a better understanding for cuffing and prisoner handling. Um, the, the techniques that were taught back then, a lot of guys didn't like because a lot of them came from high speed SWAT teams and, you know, elite military units. And they're like, hey, Greg, I don't really like the cuffing technique you're showing here. You know, and I would say, hey, I'm sorry you don't like it, but you got to know it to, to graduate. Stay after class and show me what you like. So I would look at all these techniques that these different agencies and different officers were bringing to the table. And I looked at it like jujitsu. I'm like, hey, I want to know every submission. I want to know every angle. I want to know every grip. And I really started diving into that type of martial arts or that type of of combatives with the cuffing, the prisoner handling and everything that I could. And then when I came back from there, I started working full time at, uh, at an SF unit in Bragg and um, started working on with their student base uh, in 2002, 2000, yeah, 2002, 2003, you know, and then developed some basic, basic programs for their hand to hand curriculum that would link more to, to uh, an assault, an assault on a room. For some of the people that don't know what an assault on a room would be, maybe a four or five man team um, coming into a room like a SWAT team, and they just dominate that area, you know, uh, with 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 uh, ARs and and the way they move and handle people. Um, but it was geared towards that, but also teaching guys how to defend themselves, you know, one on one on one, and um, you know. I learned a lot by creating curriculums and watching it evolve and then having different people come in and become over you as a supervisor, you know, changing what you're doing constantly to where it was like a pendulum swing. Some guys like boxing, some guys like jujitsu, some guys like just assault or based weapon force on force. And after, you know, spending a decade of bouncing back and forth, you start to create a, a, a formula that works. And in 2010, um, well, a program I developed, it was really developed around 08, but 2010, I, the SOC P program, Special Operations Combative Program, became a program of record for, for the SF community. So I developed that program based on a decade or more feedback for the assaulter. So an assaulter-based combative program, meaning that it's geared towards a pack of guys coming and dominating something. And, you know, you would think, why does the guy with the raw rifle, you know, need to know hand to hand? But it's that it's the use of force continuum. He has to handle people. He won't shoot everybody, but he's going to have to handle somebody. And in handling people, they may start to fight. And when you're a room full of furniture, small room, and there's four assaulters packed in there with rifles, and two or three people start fighting, you know, it's hard to get a good through and through shot. And is it necessary to shoot somebody because they may be fighting for whatever, you know, reason that doesn't, you know, at, you know, there's not a need to kill them. And, and certain people you may need to gather even information from. So having a good hand to hand program that ba is based on that's important. And then also realized by training different units that, you know, we were at war for, you know, eight or nine years before the SOC P really, came about and um, a lot of the SF units did not have a standard cuffing or prisoner handling methodology 
and gathering feedback, I realized that majority of all hand-to-hand incidents came from cuffing, prisoner handling, and detaining, you know, not a guy throwing up his hands. So in this cuffing, prisoner handling, uh, detaining, it, you know, there wasn't a standard. So that was why there were so many hand-to-hand situations based around that. There was not procedures to handle people and grip people to control them away. If they start to fight, you can just shut them down right away. Um, I remember doing a course and I uh, watched these guys and I try to do supply cuffs and I realized there was a real problem. I'm like, hey, have you guys ever, and this is probably 07, and these are some high speed guys. Um, have you guys ever done any cuffing? And everybody raised their hand. Yes, we've cuffed people. They've been, you know, we've been cuffing people for several years, you know, on targets overseas. I'm like, well, um, what formal training have you had? Nobody says anything. And then I'm like, who in here has had formal cuffing? One guy, one soldier raises his hand and he was a former MP. And then I knew right away that, okay, this has to be something that needs to be solved. So the SOC P program basically developed, you know, a cuffing prisoner handling methodology for soldiers in certain situations, but it links to weapon transitions uh, you know, scrambling to get to a force multiplier. And that program has now evolved into what's called, you know, SOC P, uh, LV or low vis, and then also what's called the 3SD program, solo soldier self-defense. And then another program based off that is the TAC P for law enforcement officers, tactical arrest and control procedures. But we take the basic principles that we've learned from the SOC P and we apply it to these different programs. You know, those principles are, you know, based on, you know, creating a, a program that solves the needs of the end user. You know, one thing that I learned in, in grad school was, um, you know, you, to develop something, you need to know who the end user is. And, and a lot of times in martial arts, people show up to different places for different reasons. I like grappling. I'm going to sh- go to this jujitsu class. I'm going to learn how to strike because... I, I want to strike somebody, but when somebody comes in or, 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 and says, hey, I need you to develop a program, but, you know, one, I have to define the end user. Who is, or is it, you know, at the old folks home and everybody there is 70 or years to 90 years old and I only have them for two hours. It's a totally different curriculum and their needs are different. Or is it an elite unit where these guys are at the peak of physical fitness They're the smartest out there, and you have them for, you know, uh, three or four months, you know, it's a totally different curriculum. You know, what do you want them to be able to do? You know, what tools are they traveling with? So once you define, you know, the needs, you know, and who they are, uh, you know, what are their strengths and weaknesses? Uh, And then you can start asking questions. Well, when do you, what situations have guys have done your task been in? where they need to to do hand-to-hand. And you research past events, and then you think of some that can happen, you create scenarios. And then once you create the scenarios, you train them for those scenarios, and that's how you get some of your best. That defines what you teach guys. You know, for, for jujitsu, you know, people need to figure out, you know, what what do they want to get out of it? You know, I've 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 seen jujitsu evolve. You know, over over twenty twenty five years. You know, of being involved in jujitsu and jujitsu is one of my passions. Um, I got my black belt uh, from Hoyce in two thousand and four. He gave out his first five black belts to me and four other guys at my gym in Durham, North Carolina. And um, so I, I've really dove into it, but also see how jiu-jitsu uh, principles apply in a lot of other places, you know, uh, fighting to get to a leverage position, you know, position first, as they would say, position before submission. If I'm fighting for a knife, I'm fighting for a handgun, or I'm just interviewing you or de-escalating the situation, I need to establish a good position. What is that position? Is it mount or guard, or is it me standing at an angle like a like a boxer that I could actually implement a strike or a takedown or control on you inside of that conversation and recognize that while the discussion is happening, why I'm de-escalating something. 
know those positions and know when those positions are being angled on you it is very important because once the fight happens, you know, and you find yourself, you know, on your heels behind behind the curveball, you're going to have to be a better fighter to catch back up. Um, so these these things are are important to understand, you know, in jujitsu and every everything that we do, combative, you know, related. Um, o- over the years, you know, dealing with with combatives and and everything. Um, I take a different approach than, than probably most. I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not married to any, any style or system. I think everything has its place on the shelf. You know, some people start to do certain things and, and they, and they look at it like religion. You, you just can't change their mind no matter what. And, and they just want to argue about it. You know, for me, I just explain what I need to do and I'm not going to argue with anybody about anything. I'll say, Hey, this is what I like to do, and these are the reasons why. And if somebody doesn't like it, you know, good luck to them. I wish them the best. You know, um, I think with with the evolution of jujitsu, though, I am you know seeing a trend um, where guys are focusing a lot on the sportive aspect of jujitsu, which I think that's great. I think competition, you know, go to the, you know. <clears throat> go and do all these competitions because there's a lot of stuff to gain from one-on-one and mono and mono type stuff. You know, it's you and another individual. Can you think under pressure of the situation and push through it? So psychologically, as a as cultivating the warrior mindset, there's some components that are in that one-on-one competition that can't be replaced. That just doing self-defense in a stagnant place isn't going to give you but if a guy just trains for competition and neglects the self-defense aspect he is moving away from the traditional aspects of jiu-jitsu i think there's a fine line of competing knowing what competitions you're doing and what you're tactically giving up in each competition what i mean by that is if you're if you just want to box and you go to a boxing match know that okay I'm only training for this. I have some other areas that I might be weaker at. Jiu-jitsu, if all you're doing is grappling and you're not focusing on striking or any other aspects, you know, there's some weaknesses there uh, that can be, ex- you know, it can be taken advantage of. As long as you know that and you're doing these sport tournaments for, you know, for the sake of sport and, and cultivate a warrior mindset, then it's good, but know what you're giving up. I, I, you know, for us, the way we do things is I like for my guys to compete in M- MMA and jiu-jitsu. But I also make all my guys, when they start to move up the ranks, they have to know basic Gracie self-defense. But I also add in some of the self-defense techniques that I've learned from training with some of the, the top martial artists in the world over the years, you know, uh, from Dan and Asanto uh, to Greg Nelson to Greg Jackson. To, to Mark Denny, to dozens of blade guys I had experience with with the air marshals. So we learn our traditional self-defense stuff, but we'll add other stuff to it. But also, you know, in that I'm adding obstacles too. You know, a product that I developed uh, called the Combat Cube. We use it in the SOC P. It's one of the most important things that we have in the class that, that people don't realize how important it is. And the Combat Cube there's two different sizes. There's one that's four feet by two feet by 18 inches and another one that's two feet by two feet by 18 inches. They're like giant Legos that Velcro together. So I can create any environment that I want. So if uh, an assault team's coming in the door, um, we can create partitions and move these cubes around to where their coffee table, a couch, whatever you want it to be, that's what it is. They come in that room. Then when they leave and we need to change around, we can change it around. You know, there's uh, there is furniture out there that's been around for for decades. It's padded furniture for assaulters to use, but they're so light and flimsy, they become a a hazard, and you can only use them one way. So what I realized a decade ago is I need ops, an obstacle to fight around that's safe. So I figured out the shape that I can create the most shapes with. And um, that's what came to that. And then now 
when we do our assaulter based stuff, we'll move this stuff around. We'll create cubby holes. We'll create walls and partitions and move them and shift them to where we can even be in the mat room doing a lot of stuff. Uh, if we're doing our cuffing, we'll do what's called tactical cuffing where we teach cuffing standing prone and on the ground on the wall. And then we'll add the cubes where people might be sitting, laying, and then we'll add dead space or an open doorway or saying open doors there. So now when a, your cover guy is pulling security, he's having to cuff and manipulate that guy in a way that's pulling security at the same time inside of the training facility without having to go to the shooting range. Now where these cubes help us in our self-defense stuff is I'll take these cubes, even for my guys that are you know testing for their brown belt or black belt, and they have to fight around these things. I'll set them up in obstacles in the mat room and they may be attacked by a knife. They may be sitting down and somebody approaches them with a handgun. Um, and we move up and down the self-defense, you know, use of force continuum based on this environment to where this open area that we learned to train in, this giant mat that you had to find an open area to throw this mat down, you know, you've got to learn how to fight against the objects. You know, that is one thing that that the UFC or MMA has given the martial arts community that, that people don't realize is the, the art of fighting off of a fixed object like a cage. There's a whole nother science right there, and it's, it's grappling-based. But there's not a transition from the open mat jiu-jitsu, sport jiu-jitsu, to learning how to really do that. But that links so well. But when you get into an altercation for self-defense, you're going to have a wall, you're going to have a, a couch, you're going to have objects that you get knocked over, and you have to learn how to adapt your jujitsu, your grappling around these objects to be a to be more well-rounded for self-defense. Um, so that, you know, the cubes that I designed and then mixing all this stuff together, you know, gave us a foundation to kind of evolve what we're doing in the SOTP program. And then the next element that we add to it is fighting to get to a force multiplier. A force multiplier to us is either a, could be a number two pencil, could be a handgun, could be a long gun, could be anything you do to give you an advantage, you know, uh, in the fight. So we'll have, I'll set up the cubes for some of our training to where there's one behind you in front of you and there's a wall here, set them in set positions in the clinch and say, hey, you know, this is the, you've got a weapon, he doesn't, you know, you try to shoot him, you try not to get shot, but now you're doing around obstacles. And then you really learn if you don't win the grip, the position off the initial grab, you can't knee the guy, you can't do anything. Because as soon as he spins or redirects you over that cube or that object, you've lost a tremendous amount of leverage, you see. And you're not going to be able to be as successful with your force multiplier. And he can stall you out. And if he has a support element coming, then you're going to get overwhelmed really quick. So we base a lot of our training around these obstacles. And it's only when, you know, you take a lot of these guys that do, you know, certain reality-based systems. Some are good. Some are bad. I have nothing negative to say about them. It's really based on their instructors. But they will want you to do a lot of striking and kneeing and, and think this space is going to be there. If you don't win the clinch, as soon as you lift the knee up and knee somebody in the junk, they're going to spin and redirect you over an object and you had that one shot you took and now you've lost the strategic position and you're going to get, you're going to get your candy taken from you, you know? So <laughs> that's where you see a lot of the, the jujitsu and the clinch fighting linked to what we're doing now. For me, <clears throat> you know, coming up all the way to through 2000, I was always doing jujitsu and competing, but over the last, you know, 10 years or, or probably the last seven years, I've only started focusing on jujitsu based, grappling based, you know, MMA based techniques that link to fighting with force multipliers and multiples, meaning that support elements, yours or his, you know, uh, we've got soldiers that are traveling abroad um, to meet in other countries and uh, they're a target. You know, and some of these countries are not, you know, non-permissive environments where you can't carry weapons. And um, so learning how to defend yourself in these situations, they're not, you know, the, a lot of the training that we do in an open area, 
um, there's not as much direct transfer as people think. Um, and people need to understand that there's nothing wrong with training exactly the way everybody's training. Now, if, if the guy wants to do, you know, sport Taekwondo, if he wants to do, uh, boxing, if he wants to do whatever, I, I think it's great. I think people need to train as long as they know the difference in the two and the instructor's not blinded and the student's not blinded by the gaps that they have in, in that transfer to real world self-defense, you know, uh, that, that would probably be something I would like to gear a lot of the, the martial artists out there, which a lot of them do. And then a lot of them claim that they do, but when they get back to the gym, they just do their normal thing. And that's fine. You know, to me, I could care less what I, really what a lot of them do, you know, if, if they're not open to change, you know, with me talking now is, is bringing it to certain people's attention that, Hey, you may want to think about this, but you know, some people just aren't in, in what I call receiving mode of information. You know, I can remember, um, this is back in the nineties. I remember a story where, you know, people had this weird dude come up to me. Um, I think I was at Lowe's or something buying, a, buying some stuff for the school. And I had on one of my, probably a team rock shirt or a jujitsu shirt. And you got to remember, this was the 90s. There wasn't a lot of YouTube going on back then. And this this guy comes up to me and goes, hey, you know, do you train in the martial arts? And I'm like, you know, yeah. You know, I run a school, you know, Team Rock. And, you know, you're welcome to come in and take some classes if, if you're interested. And he goes, well, you know, I I do ninja. I'm like, all right, what is what you do? What? Ninjutsu. And I'm like, OK, cool. I like I've seen a lot of, you know, I've a lot of good stuff in ninjutsu, you know, that, that's great. And, he, and I said, where do you train at? And he said, well, I train at home. I'm like, oh, do you have somebody that meets you at your house and you guys train? No, I train by myself. And I was like, well, that's cool. What, what do you do? You know, why don't you train with a partner? How, how do you progress? And he was, well, my techniques are too dangerous to train with anybody, you know, and um, I can't train with other people. I have to train by myself. Well, who, And I was like, well, who's your instructor? And he goes, well, I get it out of the books. And he just went on and on about, you know, what he did. And, and I started to get irritated for just a second. Like, I'm going to – I just wanted to smash this guy, right? <laughs> because he approached me and then he to say this stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I thought about it for a second, and I was like, well, that's good. It sounds like, you know, you're 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 getting what you want out of it. And, um, you know, if you ever need some training partners, you know, come down to Team Rock. I wish you the best. And I didn't even enter into that debate with him. I started to, and then it dawned on me, this guy was so far out in left field that he would not even get the conversation. And what I've noticed with some of the younger guys when they start debating martial arts and this, it, it's not as bad now because MMA's been out there so much and they see how it integrated together they get too emotional attachment to, to whatever it is they're doing. If you're talking to somebody and, and they start babbling about, about stuff, who cares? If, if he wants to take that journey and doesn't understand it, it's not worth, it's not worth the time of day to even talk to him. You know, let these guys, let these guys go and do their thing. But, but I, I learned right then that I'm, you know, I'm not going to enter into, to debates with people. You know, I had the same thing when, some of the training that we were doing um, abroad, I do a lot of work with the, with the big army combative program and um, even the air force combative program. And they had a big symposium. This is in 09 and they brought in all the key guys they had um, to contribute to the combative program. And uh, they had a couple guys there that were doing stuff that some of the other instructors didn't like. And they're like, Greg, you need to go over there and explain to such and such why his technique is it's so outdated and not, you know, not on track. And this guy was, you know, very, very well known. I don't want to throw him under the bus, but very well known, um, you know, back in the nineties and then still some then. And I, and I looked at him and I said, why, why would I go over there and explain to my competitor what he needs to do to improve himself? Let him do whatever he wants to do. It doesn't matter to me whatever you know and that's kind of the way i am with with the martial arts now I, i'll explain what i do but as soon as somebody doesn't 
wants to debate it or whatever they, you know, I'll debate it with them because I want to see their perspective, but I don't, I don't have time for it. And I think people get too upset when they start debating jujitsu yeah. or debating some of these things or, you know, or whatever they do, it gets out of control. Yeah. But, uh, Greg, um, the old, the, the old, uh, saying goes, uh, never get into a debate with an idiot. They'll drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. Um, <laughs> you, you, I like the way you handled that guy though. You, you, oh, what did you do? You know, and, uh, he mentioned his martial art. Oh, that's, that's great. I've seen some good things. And, and we've all had conversations like that with some other martial art. And I do think it's important to not disrespect the art that they're really dedicating their life to because you're not going to convert anybody over to, to learn anything new if you come at them and say, that's a waste of time. You're doing, you know, I can't believe you're training at home by yourself with out of a book and you're really thinking you're getting a lot out of that. But if you kind of, oh, that's interesting. Well, the door's open if you want to come in and train with us. And that's just, you know, it's it's a smart way to, you know, to treat that person, you know, with that respect, open the door up for them, kind of show them what you have the offer. But oftentimes, like you said, their mind's not open for that sort of uh, feedback or that sort of uh, invite to, to go train and test themselves and, and to learn something else. Because the, in their mind, they already know what's the best and it's the book and it's the at-home training uh, type of a thing. It's uh, clear. Yeah, and, and they're not what's called re- receiving mode, you know. Yeah. And a lot of it comes down to what uh, fear management, meaning that they're convincing themselves what they're doing inside of their comfort zone is, is going to keep them safe. But there's that little back in their mind that they kind of know that they need to, to reach outside of it, but it, it's just getting out of their comfort zone, you know, the fear management type thing. Uh, listening you know? uh, to what you – go ahead. You know, you go go oh. ahead. I know I've been traveling on for about a half an hour. No, it's, it's been – I've, I've, I've taken a ton of notes, Greg. <laughs> What was I that? I a cup of coffee, and I, my mind, I said I have a large cup of coffee, and my mind was just just vomiting all kind of stuff. It was awesome. Guys, but um, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Greg, listening to, to how you're describing some of your training with the special operations uh, uh, people and, and what you're doing there, um, it, it's clear that a big part of it, you know, training in a in an airplane in the aisle there and training, you know, with, with the cubes and trying to get – uh, you know, a, a feel for what it's like to train in a room and to fight and, and try to survive that, you know, with obstacles in your way is a big part. How could somebody who's just a regular jiu-jitsu guy like myself, who I do this a lot for fun, and that's my main thing is that I really enjoy it. Uh, how could I work in some of that as far as get, uh, you know, a little bit of a sense of the environment that I'm in in case something does happen while I'm, you know, at my front door or, you know, on the ground next to a couch. And, and how could I kind of kind of put myself there a little bit ahead of time? That That's a great, great question. And I've, I've done it this in, in several ways. Um, one, if, if you've got seams in your mat or you want to – and if you have padded walls, you can do the, hey – I'm going to, whoever can touch the other person against the wall, you know, and your back touches the wall, then um, you probably would have spun them over a couch or an obstacle in the room. Also, you can take um, tape, almost like a, it's like sumo wrestling. You know, you're trying to drive people out of a, out of a room or out of a, out of a, out of an area, out of a circle. So that drills, that's been around for, for decades, you know, but people don't see the value in that type of, sumo type i'm going to move a guy out of this particular space but if you take and say if i can move you out of this space your legs are going to clip something and that's my takedown so really a lot of that's about winning the actual grips if you watch a sumo match you know whoever gets that good grip on the guy's you know little little uh, g-string there a little little i don't even know i can't even think of the technical <laughs> yeah term. you know and they're gonna lift the other guy up and toss him or move him out of just the tie up so the whole fight is about winning the grips. Um, so you can block that off and take, or if you don't have combat cubes, you know, it's, uh, if you need them, it's uh, txcombatives.com. Just like Texas, tactical extreme combatives.com. I sell them out to the military there. Um, but you can stack up. I would recommend folding mats and stacking them up to a certain height 
and it's a little bit safer to drive people over that. Be careful with what shoes you have on. You know, I think sometimes it's important to to wear shoes if you're going to fight in shoes. I know on the jiu-jitsu mats, shoes are, are no-no, but wrestling shoes or something are, are a little bit safer because depending on what surface area the membrane of the mat is, if it's a real soft wrestling mat, uh, your toes or the traction of shoes can get caught. And when you're driven over something uh, uh, like a, a stack mats or cubes, you can cause knee injuries if that foot can't pivot properly. Uh, I have very, very few injuries ever happen because I I see the potential for it and I adjust and I make sure that my mats have a thick membrane and aren't, aren't too soft like some of the uh, wrestling mats might give way a little bit. Um, so so think about that when you're doing these drills, spinning and, you know, what kind of shoes you have on and and um, seams that are open, you know, where toes can get caught in or pivoted are, are important. But also, even I've been on the road training units and guys out in open fields, um, we would fight for uh, for training handguns and stuff. And I would even take uh, a water bottle. I've done I couldn't find walls, didn't have mats. I had several hours to train these guys. And I uh, took a water bottle because every, every, everybody had a water bottle. So take your water bottle. You're going to get an over and under hook tie up. Or we'll start with single collar tie ups or double collar tie ups, different positions. Put the water bottle right between both of you. Your objective is to make him knock the water bottle over. It's really hard to, to make somebody if they're really focused on it. But what happens is guys learn how to adjust their weight and maneuver in a safer environment without causing injuries to one another. And we're doing it in, in uh, open fields. I've actually done it in, uh, in a parking lot. And I told the guys, hey, you can't take your guy down. Uh, only, you know, I think one guy may have a couple of times guys have fell, but they didn't, they didn't get injured. But um, it's just the drill of moving around and feeling that force on force. And then we'll, you know, for us, we'll take the blocks and put them, you know, around at least on two sides, you know. And then now you're spinning and you, you'll feel the importance of winning that tie up because the same grip you need to execute that throw or that double leg or that single leg, you don't need that much of a grip to be able to just redirect somebody and push them. And then when you're defending something, you know, people are used to having all this room to sprawl and move around. Well, you know, think about any room in your house. There's a, the biggest place you have is probably in your living room, and there's not a lot of room there. And I, you know, you can remember as a kid wrestling in the house, you know, you may move the coffee table. It takes about 30 seconds for your mom's in there screaming at you for tearing up, knocking everything over because you can't stay in that one spot. It, it, it's just not going to happen. So learning how to use the obstacles around you to, to take somebody down and win that leverage position, you have to know it. If you don't know it, you, you, you're, there's a big hole in anybody's game, even for the guys that are carrying any force multiplier, law enforcement officers or anybody. If you can't win the clinch, you're at a deficit when the fight happens because you're not going to be able to control the distance like a lot of the the combative systems out there, they, they, vision, they envision themselves controlling this gap. And it's too hard to control. There's too many variables, especially when you can't back up and you hit a table or something or a wall or a parking lot with a car. The problem is these techniques are taught out in every combative center all over the you know, federal law enforcement. They're all in open mats. So the moves that the students see enable them to sprawl and circle and move, work great in that environment. And, and it's not that the move's wrong. I'm not saying that what they're teaching is wrong. I'm, what, I, what I'm saying is there's not the direct transfer that they're going to need when obstacles are there, you see. And when you add the obstacles, one thing, you know, then with that, you have to add your strikes to it. So I tell the guys, okay, you're fighting around these obstacles. You can knee now. You can strike now. But what happens is this. The guys realize at a certain point in that if they don't win the grip, they can't need the guy. If I tie, if I grab you and I don't have a, if I didn't win the grip, I can't strike you, but one time and you're going to drive me over. Some. If I have to, if I want to break contact from you, if I don't win the grip, in that it's really hard to break contact from you successfully in a confined space. So, the the funnel for all combatives. You know, with, when force multipliers and and more people are involved and furniture are involved, 
the funnel that I've come to the conclusion of doing this for so long is you need to win the grip, the grips of the fight. Now, does he have a jacket on? Is it more judo grips? There's more Greco grips, sumo grips, whatever the clothing will dictate, the environment will dictate. And when, I, when I'm saying you need to learn to win the grips, it doesn't mean you're initiating winning the grips. There's law enforcement officers who go, well, I don't want to grab the guy. I don't want, I'm not, and I'm like, hey, I'm not telling you to grab the guy. I'm telling you, when he goes to grab you, you need to instinctively gravitate to this position. And knowing that it's not enough, if you don't win or lose those positions hundreds of times, you're not 50% ready for the actual fight. And even if you've done it, even if you've done it your whole life, who's grabbing you? Randy Couture, you know, <laughs> some of these world-class guys grab you with good freaking luck, you know? I mean, and understand that you're at a deficit and understand that you're going to need to now go to a force multiplier a lot faster and prepare for the, being thrown over that object, you know? We've developed certain techniques that when you get taken over these objects, what to do with your legs to create space to get to a force multiplier. And we integrate that into our training to where whenever you do get taken down over that object, you fall to the ground, you're like a cat. You're not giving up side or mount over an object or whatever it's at. And it's a different methodology than what's actually taught in a lot of the self-defense uh, situations. But once a guy, a, a basic blue belt, sees it, he recognizes it. It's just some slight... Uh, adjustments that have to happen because of that object that we that we've integrated into it um but it but it's there they just need to learn where the fight that and um not to gravitate under stress to certain situations you know um that that's around them so i would recommend that as a as a training aid for your takedowns um other training aids that i'll do and i've done this for years and this is how i developed a lot of my edge weapon techniques um is i would grapple with, I would start with, with white belts and blue belts and then move up the food chain. But I would grab their dominant hand and pretend they have a knife in their hand and they don't even know it. I would do it standing. I would do it on the ground. I would say, I'm pretending he has a force, some kind of edge weapon, force multiplier in his hand, you know, whatever it might be, a, a sap, uh, a pipe, a rock. And I latch onto that hand. And I submit him and control him in a way that that hand's not going to touch me. And I grapple that way. And what you'll see if you do that long enough, certain techniques that you already know that work on force on force, reality based stuff will come to the surface. And then those moves will start to become part of your game. And whatever the moves those are, if you base on your body type, Start gravitating to that in your jujitsu, because when somebody shanks you with a knife, you know you're going to know it when the steel goes in you, but you're not going to disappear. You know, people think, oh, well, he touched me with a knife, I'm dead. No, you're not dead. People get stabbed hundreds of times, and they're still there. I mean, YouTube knife assaults and see how many times people get poked. Now you don't know what stab is going to kill you. It could be the first one. It could be the hundred stab. But that first one, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to, you're not a vampire and it's not a wood stake. You're not going to pop into a, a bunch of smoke. You're going to be there and you're like, fuck, he just stabbed me. Oh, fuck, I just got stabbed again. I may or may not be bleeding internally and bleeding out, but I've got to hang on to this tool and, and either stall out or, or, or deal with the situation until, you know, support comes or, or till I can deal with it. But the only way to really get good at it is force on force. There's no, you know, I see a lot of good techniques that are out there that are taught in self-defense. But the problem of it is, no matter how good these techniques are, if they're not met and developed with force on force, that individual doesn't understand timing and ranges and how to really execute the technique. That's the problem where you see a lot of these, you know, good reality-based techniques shown, but these guys just practice it. It's like me doing an arm bar, you know? It's like a white belt. Imagine this. You got a white belt. He's been coming in. He's been working on bars for, for weeks now. You know what I mean? And then you got to roll with him and he throws his leg over and starts snatching on your arm and you, and, and you know, he's below your elbow. It's like, is he trying to do a wrist lock <laughs> or what's he doing? He's squeezing forever. He thinks he's got you. And you just push his leg over and pass. And you're like, dude, what's up? Because I had your arm. How did you get out? Like, 
dude, you didn't have my elbow and your timing was off. You like threw your leg and totally missed the timing of when the arm was actually extended. And they just don't get it for a while. That's the same thing with people do a lot of their self-defense stuff. If you don't take it, you've got to learn it in that environment. And then you got to figure out ways to make it work force on force. And then you've got to win or lose hundreds of times before you're 50% ready. If not, it's not going to be there for you. Now, if you don't care about self-defense or care about expanding your game, then that's fine. But know where you're weak at. Don't think that you're going to be ready when that mugging happens. You know, you might be ready if it's grandma with a butter knife. You know, you can do whatever you want to But if it's a 300-pound linebacker with abs with a razor-sharp butcher knife, it's a totally different game. Totally different game, you know. Yeah. And people say, oh, well, I'll just run or I'll shoot them. Well, you may not have your, you may not be able to get your gun out fast enough, and we proved that with the twenty-one foot rule. And you may be fast, but he might be faster, you know. And there's been soldiers overseas have been hit with machetes in the back running, you know. And it's it's happened, you know. There's tons and tons of stuff that's gone down. So, you know, understanding it just added a little more layer to it. So, how to take these techniques? If that would be something I would recommend. Um, doing also for your striking you know um i would you know when you float your jab out what you know open up your hand inside your glove and imagine yourself you know eye gouging them you know floating a finger in an eye to set up your right hand if you're you know doing leg kicks do a lot of inside leg kicks because if you can inside leg kick somebody you could have kicked them in the junk now i'm not saying kicking somebody in the junk or poking them in the eye is going to finish the fight but it's a good it's a good lead it's a good distraction to set up some of the bigger tools you know, um, even in your jujitsu, I remember going to Torrance, California in the early nineties and the jujitsu was different then. we would line up and we would do achieve the clinch where there would be a black belt with boxing gloves on and you would kick and try to get in and wrap him up while he's trying to take your head off. And you had lines of white belts all the way up to brown belts trying to achieve the clinch. This was in the early nineties, basic jujitsu. And then I remember... I was, you know, I was used to striking from my striking background. There was a purple belt there that was with me, and he was from somewhere else. Really good dude. We had rolled for several days. I would take a week vacation um, and go down there for weeks at a time and hit every class. But I remember rolling this guy for several days. He did the same thing, and we could never catch. We were stalemating all the time, and I was like a purple belt with one stripe. And then Hoy said, all right, we're going to do this drill where you're, you know, you're lightly, slightly – slapping the top of the person's head, you know, and, and creating, getting used to strikes coming. So I started this guy's guard. He was striking at me. I couldn't pass his guard, but I wasn't getting hit. Then we switched. Within that four minute rotation, I started slightly popping him on top of the head. I hit him with an arm bar and then I hit him with a triangle, but I rolled him days before. couldn't even come close. And then I realized he was not, his grappling was not used to being mixed with strikes. And it opened him up to be vulnerable for stuff that he knew better because he was overcompensating for stuff, you know. Um, so adding these drills to your jujitsu, like even even some of these guys jumping into the half guard, you know, understanding the half guard sweeps are really good, but you're going to have to make sure you're doing it the right way. If not, a guy is going to be dropping elbows on your face, and um, you just jumped in the half mount if you if you didn't get it deep enough and didn't get settled in. But the half guard sweeps are very important because you can make them work. But I think there's that gap of being really deep and really in the right spot to really make it work or hanging out in the death zone. And I see a lot of these guys will jump down there. They're hanging out in the death zone for strikes, but it works for them, you know, because they're not having to deal with strikes. And even certain grips that guys gravitate to that they could change that would eliminate, make it less likely to get hit you know, or control a limb from getting stabbed, you know. Other drills that I've done over the years, too, was I'll take a, a tactical, a training tactical fold, which is, you know, a, a, a knife that, that folds up that you can, tra- you know, stab, it just doesn't have an edge on it. And I would give it to the guy on bottom, and I would start guys in the half guard. And I would tell the guy on bottom, you can go for the knife whenever you want to, and the guy on top, you can't go for the knife until he does. And you watch these guys start to fight. And then there's, you know, and crazy things happen. You know what I mean? 
You see knives bouncing across the ground. You see guys <laughs> going for it too soon and not having, not being in a leveraged position to control the weapon. You know, and then you had to do handguns that way. And then you add some munitions to that as well, to where uh, some munitions are shoot paintballs out. Uh, it's like a bullet, but you can also do it with with certain airsoft. Now is you know heavy duty metal airsoft, so you're not snapping these things in two in the fight. But you start integrating this stuff together. You know, you'll see a a, a lot of your jujitsu stuff has direct transfer over, but it's a certain style of jujitsu. You know, and MMA style of jiu-jitsu is different than the sport of style of jiu-jitsu you know but also adding weapons to it's a different style in itself too and it's kind of a mixture you know it does link more towards the striking side of it uh than it does the, the sports side of of grappling but it's it's there you know um so i challenge i challenge the instructors to do that if you want to you want to do something fun for your students you know um give them a training knife and, and have them start in odd positions and have them just, you know, they can start standing and put some stuff around them so guys aren't running all over the place. Start them in fixed positions. And what you do is you say this, don't stop when you get stabbed. The game is this, get stabbed the least amount of time. So if you if you have a knife, uh, Byron, and we're training, yeah, and we start training, I'll say, all right, you know, I want to get stabbed the least amount of time. So you may stab me 15 times. Okay, now it's my turn. We switch start in the same position now my game is i've got to get stabbed less than 15 times to win right you see yeah and then now you're you're cultivated where you're not stopping the problem is people do these self-defense stuff and they stop reality there is no stopping in the sense too that that these slices and stuff there's only a few spots you're going to hit somebody that you're going to really put them out in, in less than you know five or ten seconds you know um, but you've got to progress your training to where you're constantly going, okay, I would have bled out by now, but I'm going to continue to go because you can't be stagnant in training. And I even tell that to my, my, my students, you know, when we start in certain positions or, or I'll see guys that roll with other guys and they get stabbed and they just hold the guy. I'm like, all right, don't just hold the guy. You know, why you hold? Well, um, you know, I'm 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 gonna go for this. I'm gonna go for the move or do something because you're stifling his training and your training. I tell my students, you get to a position, and you you stay there for a little bit, look for something, and move. Because if you just take the wrestle mentality, I'm gonna pin you on your back and hold you. Because this round, I, I passed your guard and I want to beat you, and I'm gonna stall out. That's fine for tournament, but you're stifling everybody's training. You know, don't hold them there. You move to the other side. I either move to the other side or I'm going to put him on top of you. And I make them either step, cross, circle all the way around the head, get to the other side, or attempt them out. You're stifling the training by just holding that one position and not moving and force the, force the play to happen. You know, those, those are drills that I think that, you know, really help guys progress, you know, uh, with, with their jujitsu. Yeah. Um, but, but there's, you know, I'm just throwing stuff out off the top of my head. You know, there's, there's a bunch of other drills that we do, um, but you know I could go on and on with things that we we've created and done to set up you know for and then you add other elements to it with multiples you know um, another drill that I actually got this we used to do this years ago. Hoist used to do it with us, and uh, we would do team grappling. Byron, wow, have you yeah. ever grappled on on, on the guys like you took the class and split it in half? And it was yeah. that class against the other other. We yep. we we That's did it two real... years in a row at uh, Christmas time, and uh, it it was a little bit more chaotic than I think we had planned. But I definitely saw value in that. Well, it changed. It, it lets you know that the tactics that you use is very important. Um, tactics, and when I teach combatives for self defense, it goes a lot into tactics because. This is something you have to have to, to, to win any encounter and be successful. You have to know where the fight really is and where the threats are. But in this, you know, you would figure out certain games. And we, well, we would we put limitations for safety. We would say no foot locks. Reason being is if one guy's got my upper body twisting one way and you go diving over cranking on my foot, you know, something may snap. So we, we, we eliminate foot locks in these 
battles. You know, you take the class, you pick your two top guys, you say, all right, start picking teams, one side's on the other, and then you start coming towards each other. But then you start to learn the, the game of it. You take, you know, one of your one of your guys that might be able to survive with the, their best guy, you know, or their second best guy. And you say, just jump guard and hold him. <laughs> Don't even try to do nothing to stall him out, you know. Then you send a couple of your guys to their weakest guys, and then you start knocking them off while you start out their better guys, right? And then now you you – now you do two on one type stuff, and then you you start to take that tactic, and it works. But if you just go at it like, okay, whoever's in front of me, we're just going to go at it. You know, you're leaving a lot to chance. But if you start implementing these tactics and set up a game plan, and they're not, you're going to win ninety nine percent of the time because of your game plan. If you're reasonably set up equally, you know. So having tactics for everything is is key. You know, when um. You know, for a lot of the self-defense stuff, you know, people, you know, when we're doing, when you're doing martial arts and teaching even self-defense techniques, you know, that that's only part of the solution for self-defense. Other things that we we get into, you know, um, is verbal de-escalation, you know, um, profiling or visual frisking of the of the individual, what's on, around, or near, you know, multiples that may be with them. Um, things like that have to go into self-defense. You know the laws of the land, you know, um, the legal laws, and then know uh, the area that you're in, you know. What's the use of force continuum based on the environment that you're in? There's a legal use of force continuum, right, that you need to know for that area. You know, what tools can you use? How do things need to be articulated based on the state, the country that you might be in? But there's also the use of force continuum in the environment that you're in doesn't always link. Reason being, you could be in, say, Hollywood, you know, California, you know, or what I would say in, in Raleigh, around Raleigh, it could be Cary, a, a more uh, high-end area. A guy could jump out of his car, out of his BMW, and, and start cussing at you and get real loud, and you're probably not going to worry about it as if you go downtown Durham, you know, uh, 15 minutes down the road, a guy jumps out of his car dressed a certain way and he starts threatening you, you know right away that you're going to probably move up and down the use of force or move up the use of force continuum faster in one than you will the other based on the environment that you're in because that environment in some of the, the poor areas, you know they're more likely to go violent quicker than the guys in the, in the more in a more wealthier area. You know, I, and that's just you know, social engineering, that's just the way it is, you know, um, you have to understand that for self-defense as well. But anyway, I know I'm moving off in a lot of different directions, but what, what's some of the stuff you, you want to, want to discuss? I don't want to get too, too off topic. Yeah. A, a lot going on there. Um, uh, the, there's a lot when we're trying to look at, uh, people who just mostly train jujitsu and who are, uh, maybe we started just to as a self defense interest, but uh, over time it just become uh, more of a hobby or a passion. It, but you know, you've mentioned a lot about um, you know who you're actually fighting against could be a, you know a big deal. Um, objects in the room play a big uh, thing. Um, other people, you know, whether they're on your team or not on your team. Um, uh, striking, of course, you know, with that, you know, they also could throw in, you know, biting, hair pulling, groin strikes, a lot of just different tactics that we don't consider. Uh, yeah, and, and I was thinking about when you're talking about um, having to uh, try to control or fight somebody on the airplane, you know, bystanders. I mean, the whole airplane is full of people who you don't want to hurt. And, and just recently you mentioned, uh, like, the legal implications of things. Uh, knowing kind of the rules of the land you're in and, and how much trouble are you willing to get in. Yes, you must, you know, survive this confrontation. And if, you know, but ultimately you also don't want to go to jail and get in trouble for a long time either. So you really need to, to learn those. So there is a lot of elements, uh, in, and a lot of those can be kind of addressed just by learning about them. Uh, you know, and, and another thing, <laughs> I've written a lot of notes of, as, uh, as you've kind of been explaining some things to me, uh, it, it, trading with a, with a fake knife, uh, I've done that before a few times. 
And when I get stabbed, I lose. Okay, you got me. Let's try it again. But no, I need to continue to to okay get that knife out of my chest and now control it. Okay, you got me again. Okay, and just keep proceeding and kind of tally up how many you take, and maybe look for patterns in in weak parts of your game. But don't just stop uh, when you catch that one part of the blade. Okay, you won. And in reality, the fight's not over. You know, if if you're in an actual fight and somebody stabs you, you don't quit and say, "Well, you got me." You're going to get stabbed a whole bunch more times. So definitely that's great advice. Tons of stuff you've mentioned here. I wrote down the uh, 21 foot rule. Could you describe that to us a little bit? Yeah, uh, it's basically for law enforcement. They've established that anybody with an edge weapon at 21 feet can close on an officer before he can transition, you know, to a handgun. And uh, we would do drills based on that. Now, it, it isn't it, it once an officer if an officer has room enough to to angle back up and depending on him on on the speed of the individual he may be able to get the weapon out and and fire the weapon you know and engage the threat but you know just because you shoot somebody doesn't mean they're gonna gonna drop and also too that the part of the danger is in that that's not even discussed even in the twenty one foot rule is when you're having to engage a threat under that kind of duress it's coming at you with a knife. You know, um, making sure you get a good through and through shot or a good shot, a clean shot. And a clean shot means is that round going to travel through him or are you going to miss him and hit an innocent bystander? You know, it, what I tell that a lot of the soldiers is every round tells a story and it has to be the right story. Um, so can you take an, a, a shot and be accountable for it under that kind of stress? And that changes the tactics that the officers have to utilize, you know. Um, but you know, something I've been trying to force for a long time is called, that's the 21 foot rule based on knives, but I've been screaming, Hey, what about the clinch rule? Meaning that if a law enforcement officer is in, in, in his uniform and you initiate a clinch with him, he should have the right to move up and down lethality faster than what he's already doing, you know, because it's too easy for some of these trained guys to take some of these officers that are one honestly don't have the training that people think that they do very little training at all and a lot of them you know are caught behind the curveball and it's too easy for them to get their their weapon system taken from them you know especially with with people with mma and, and all the jujitsu and grappling that's being shown on every you know broadcast constantly on tv these criminals they could be just a great athlete, but they've been lazy their life and didn't accomplish much. But they're good street fighters. They watch that technique, and they have it. They go out and beat up some kid and practice it. And they got enough balls to grab an officer that's armed. You know, they're, they're a major threat. So, you know, there needs to be some kind of what I call clinch rule. You initiate. Granted, you would have to initiate contact with the officer. But the problem is an unarmed person grabs an officer you know, they, they have to be real careful legally on what they're doing, you know, I mean, and a lot of the officers aren't trained enough to move up and down lethality, meaning that, um, and, I, and I've proven this in the scenarios that I ran for, for, for over a decade, that, that I can set up scenarios that's going to amp the situation up to where you can justify and you need to kill this guy. But then all of a sudden you amp it right back down and add a little twist to it. And they're stuck in that Rolodex spin uh, they've already come to the conclusion they got to shoot the guy, but then the guy breaks contact, but you've already told your mind, I need to shoot this guy. And being under so much stress, under normal situations, you would stop right away. But the stress forces you to continue to do the same thing. That's why you see people um, under stress and they just keep repeating the same thing, thinking that something different is going to happen, no matter if it's first aid or, you know, your house blows up and you're over there picking up stuff that doesn't matter, you know. Uh, in, in the middle of a tornado, whatever it might be, it's that stress, you know? And um, so the, the, that's why you have things like the 21 foot rule. It was originally identified back in the uh, late eighties, early nineties, that that stress is there, but it's still there. In so many other things, you know? Um, but hopefully I probably gave you more information on that than you needed to know, but it's a, it's an ongoing thing when, when you're dealing with stress, on the spur of the moment, you know, where you're just getting mugged, you know, um, that, that Rolodex of, of old shit answer is going to start to spin. And if you didn't, wasn't trained enough 
or didn't simplify your answers enough to solve the basic problems on the stress, it's going to continue to spin. You know, some of the things are out there. People say, oh, it's, you know, fight or flight or you freeze because you're scared. You know, after training guys and running guys through scenarios, thousands of scenarios to for uh, for uh, soldiers and, and other units abroad, I've come to the conclusion that there's there's the fight, right? There there is the there is the the flight response, but the freeze response isn't necessarily out of fear. The freeze response is the processing of information under stress becomes overwhelmed, and the person doesn't mind fighting anybody that's in that situation or shooting anybody. They're trying to process and make the right answer, but the answers keep changing. Or it's like that white belt, right? that's watched too many YouTube techniques and he can't think about what move to do. And he's in the wrong position trying to move that just passed him by. Meaning that, you know, he might be mounted on somebody, sees the guy stick his arm up and he's just in the heat of the mud. It doesn't realize the arm's not there anymore, but he's still going to go for the arm. You see stress for these officers or anybody too is the same thing like that, that they get caught in that decision-making and they end up making the wrong decision because of this, this stress that's going on in the, in the body, you know, and that's where I refer back to competition. You know, earlier I was talking about, I, I like guys to compete because it develops the warrior mindset and an ability to make decisions on the stress and in the mono mono situation. There is some direct linkage from, you know, guys competing in that type of force on force, boxing, wrestling, jujitsu, MMA, where it's you and another person that I see that those guys can make better decisions sometimes in the stress with the fact that they are given the right tools to make the right decisions, meaning that sometimes guys will make, make a decision, but they don't know what that right answer is going to be. You didn't train them in certain techniques that would solve the problem, you know, and then once they see it price them enough, then they can interject those properly and make better decisions under stress because they've been in competition and had to function with some sort of stress inoculation. You see, yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah, that that the stress is a huge factor. That you know, as people you know watch the news and they see uh, different things unfolding, sometimes we forget that that officer is under a ton of stress and there's a lot going on that they're trying to to just do at the same time and they're not. Uh, commonly in these situations, like we get to train all the time, but but put in the, you know they don't get this sort of a repeated environment to to deal with potentially shooting somebody with that stress level, uh, you know, like it would be uh, quality training. I'm I'm a firefighter here in the town I'm in, and I've been fortunate to see a ton of really good uh, quality police work protecting uh, police officers and the citizens that uh, that live here. And fairly recently. Probably I don't know a year or so ago, uh, there was an officer that you know there was film of of the of the officer that responded to a call of a individual uh, brandishing a gun in the neighborhood, walking around, and he responded and and they ended up kind of uh, you know a, a bit of a standoff in front of somebody's yard, and the guy in the house is filming it, of course, and the uh, the person pulls out his cell phone from his pocket. And points it at the officers like it's a gun, and he's shoot me. You know, he's 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 saying that and trying to trick them into into making a mistake. And the officers are calling him by his name, and and you know they know him already from previous uh, encounters. And it, it, the, the particular individual who is kind of uh, the the first officer on the scene who kind of maintained it has been an officer for a very long time and has a ton of experience and and dealt with this sort of thing before. So I, I, I was just really happy that. He he had the uh, I don't know if it's stress or the situational awareness that okay that was his phone and he did it repeatedly he kept trying to 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 goad him into making mistakes until he finally you know turned around and and got started getting into his vehicle and that's when that same officer decided to tase him and uh, and, and there was big uproar about why this guy was tased you know and and people were complaining about it. In all respects, that officer saved that man's life. You know, if if you would have taken um, that one officer and switched him out with you know randomly ten other officers, you know, you know, and ran through the same scenario, that guy probably would have died a couple of times. You know, pulling his phone out, you know, acting like it was a gun, and it was just uh, you know that 
that stress level. Nobody wants to shoot a guy who's pointing a phone at them. <laughs> but you know, it's just yeah. nobody under, A lot of people don't understand the kind of stress that they go through and and the risk that the officer was taking by waiting to see that was a phone. Okay, he's pulling something else. That was a phone again. Okay, that was his phone. Stop doing this. You're gonna you get hurt. You know and. And then he he drew the line that we can't get back in the car, and he stopped it from that. But um, that officer has a, t- a lot of experience, and I and I know him personally. But um, yeah, it's it, it's hard to train for those situations. So you kind of mentioned you go up and back down the scale of lethality. You know, we always think of it. At least I made the mistake of thinking is you go up the scale. You know, like okay, this guy is a threat. Okay, he's a mild threat. Okay, he's trying to kill me. You know, and so we don't ever. I don't ever think about taking things back down a notch. Okay, now now he's not. You know, I don't know what would be a thing that would take it back down. But uh, you mentioned that, and it's hard to come down off of that um, threat level. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it. We we've done the scenarios with working with law enforcement officers with the cell phone, and similar to what you're saying there. We add what's nice to do in more of a confined space, one on one, and then add the simunitions to it because there's some pain with that um and it and the weapon system cycles and you keep hitting these officers with that and it and not not every not every officer is is going to respond the same all the time and have that same you know ability to do that you know and and it's hard and and when he does when these officers what people don't understand is when these officers do that they're putting their lives in jeopardy you know by balancing back and forth with this crazy guy is he going to engage me, you know, with a handgun or, or what's going to happen? And a lot of times they're not given enough sustainment training, meaning they may have went through a great academy, but that was eight years ago, you know? And since then, they've seen videos of officers getting killed and this happening, that happening, and their buddies get killed or other stuff happening. And, and they just want to go home to their, to their families, you know? They don't, you know... I, I, I don't see these officers rolling out going, hey, I'm going to kill somebody today or whatever. The, the, these officers are, are people. Their adrenaline gets flowing, and the only thing that's going to help them is, is their training. But each one of these individuals are different, you know, um, and their perception of reality is slightly different based on the experiences that they've had and their experience to, to, to do whatever, shoot or, or their accuracy or, or, or whatever. You know, all these things are, you know, come into play. But to, to amp things up, you know, a lot of what we'll do is, is, you know, we may start a slow pace and then all of a sudden, blam, you hit somebody with something and then you, it goes cold again. And then you create a jack in the box moment where something totally different pops out. And then when that happens and you do that, um, you, you, a lot of things can happen, you know, where guys don't make the right decisions or guys will shoot, you know, um, and, and I, I've done it in situations where I've had, you know, scenarios where guys were were uh, were secured, and another guy breaks free, and then they start fighting, and the guys that are cuffed start fighting, and um, the guy started engaging even guys that were were restrained because they were fighting, but he was losing losing the situation. You know, there's countless things that happen when when you do that, and you can get a different result with different people, but. I, you know, you can set a scenario up where you can take the most liberal person that will say, I would never shoot anybody. And and you can put them in a situation to where they will shoot somebody to save save the life of a loved one. That's where you really get them. You may not care about your life, but somebody else. But then amp it up enough to where I, where I believe that you could have them shoot an underarm person and end up going to jail uh, legally for it if it was set up the right way. You know, it it could happen. And um, people just don't understand that because you can objectively armchair quarterback situations, you know. And and the law kind of knows that because a lot of the use of force stuff is, you know, I perceived my perception, that individual's perception, you know. Um, Key things to to keep in mind is, you know, like I even work with with certain people uh, is is to have a, a, you know, have verbal things to say or don't say anything at all. But, you know, even if I was in altercation and had to shoot somebody and I was a law enforcement officer, you know, you may want something in, in or, or a soldier. You know, you're fighting for your weapon system. Well, if this person grabs you and, and engages you in, in an aggressive way, you're not in control of your weapon systems. So 
for the safety, for my safety and the safety of everybody around me, I was not, uh, in, I was not in control of my weapon system. So for the safety, uh, for my safety and the safety of everybody around me, I engaged the threat uh, for those reasons, you know. So have something to, to base what you're saying because sometimes things go down and it's a justified shooting, but the first thing that may come out of this uneducated a officer or soldier's thought is, hey, you know, he grabbed me, so I shot him. Well, you know, if Jag gets a hold of that and you go tell your buddies, yeah, he grabbed me, so I shot him, you need to articulate that a little bit better. I can tell the way the scenario went down, you did definitely need to, the guy needed to be, you know, engaged uh, in this, in, you know, but you're going to need to phrase it different. You know, uh, there, were, there were unknown threats in the room. I could not clear that space or other people engaging. Uh, this guy grabbed me. I was not in control of my weapon systems at the time. So for my safety and the safety of everybody around me, I engaged the threat. And life, you know, we train officers of that, but where is that for the civilian? The civilian is not left with this decision making. So you take a guy, you go, okay, you know how to do jujitsu, you know how to do these things, but, you know, do you know how to use force multipliers? Do you know how to de escalate? You know, if somebody breaks into your house at night, you know, um, although I've been a black belt for over a decade, I'm not probably, you know, going to meet him hand to hand. I'm going to, I'm going to grab a, a, a force multiplier, you know, either a rifle or a handgun, and I'm going to engage that threat, you know, but do I have the verbal cues to know the laws of the land? Because certain places you can't engage certain threats, even if they're in their, your house. If he's leaving and you shoot him, there's a problem. How do you know he's not running for cover to engage you, you know? So you really need to know the laws of the land, but you also need to know how to articulate the situation so you don't get bought up in something, you know, that's not really your, your fault, you know? Um, so any altercation that happens, even from a, a hand-to-hand -hand situation in a bar, you know, to somebody tries to rob you, did you do, use the obsessive force? And it's all going to be based on people around you, you know. If you get an altercation, how about, you know, people remember more of what they hear than what they see. or And you can convey more people. So if I'm in a, in a, a bar or, or parking lot or and there's groups of people around and somebody, uh, you know, assaults me and I'm fighting them and I say, hey, you know, and I'm beating them in the face and I'm saying, drop the knife, drop the knife. Do I see? I may not even see a knife, you know, but everybody around you is going to hear, hey, that guy had a knife and he hit him. You know what I mean? Or, or if I'm saying, get your hand out of your pocket, you know, drop the weapon. Don't don't grab the weapon. Everybody will say, oh, that guy had a weapon. That's why that guy hit him. You see, that's why that guy was doing what he did. And, and you have all these, you, you, you know, you cultivated the situation for your for your your needs, you see. To keep you out of trouble, I don't advocate that. But if you're doing what you need to do, and some thug comes on you, you know, you need to be at the prep environment for the, you know, there's the before, there's the during, and there's the after. And and sometimes during you're prepping the after. You see, sometimes yeah. before you're prepping the after. You're prepping the like even for for assault cases, you know, basic you know hand to hand situations is you de-escalate, somebody approaches you, right? He's getting all in your grill. You say, hey, man, I'm sorry. You keep your distance, I, I, you know, I'm, and you're de-escalating the situations. Hey, please keep your hands to where I can see them. I don't know you, and, and this is, you know, a real threatening gesture. I don't know what, you know, what weapons you may have on. Just keep your distance. I'm going to move over here. You leave, you leave A, point A, and move over to another location. When you move away, if he follows you over there, that doesn't litigate very well at all. Because then, when you tune this guy up, you've already established that you you see that he might be armed. I conveyed to him that I thought he was armed. I moved over here. He followed me over there. So then I engaged him in, in a hand-to-hand -hand situation for my safety. That's a totally different thing than to stand there and argue with a guy. So what you did... Before you beat this dude down, one, you conveyed that you thought he was armed. Two, you left and moved to another location. He's an asshole. He follows you over there. 
Now, when you handle the situation, you prep the after before, you see? Does that make sense? Yeah. I don't advocate this stuff, but when the cops come rolling up and he's trying to charge you for an assault charge, you know, or you may have broke his arm and he wants you to pay his doctor bill and you're going to have a criminal record, you know, for assault, you know, misdemeanor assault. But if you're a trained martial artist and he finds out about it, you've been doing jujitsu for five or six years, that could turn into a felony. You see, if he has a good lawyer. So if you don't prep yourself to say, hey, you know, because you are trained in the martial arts, you know, no matter what it is, you know, whatever the system might be, it could be a good system, it could be a bad system, that legally can be used against you because they're going to try to hold you at a higher standard if the guy was unarmed, you see. Yeah. Then you're going to have size. You have the profiling of how big is this guy, you know. Is it a male or is it a female? How old is this person? You know, all these things have to be taken into account. So when you just take students and you train them for the daring, you know, during the altercation, there's there's a there's an obligation for that that comes with self defense. You know, your your verbal de escalation, your verbal prepping of the before for the after, you know, um, and also just having good verbal skills that you can fall back on when somebody jumps in your grill, you know, and you did not expect somebody to be that hostile to you. Can you have a few words to say, hey, man, you know, whoa, hey, dude, you need to relax. I'm sorry you're upset, but then explain to him, you know, I like to add the but to some of the verbal de-escalation, meaning that, hey, hey, man, you know, I'm sorry you're upset, but you need to calm down and you give them the reasons and then you give them your perspective if you can. You know, you also want to, you know, save face for your psychological ego later, you know, which is a whole nother issue and all of that anyway. For all of us, you know, majority of my fight as a kid was really based on I wasn't going to back down from anybody. And I, I didn't, you know, it, and it was on. And I would probably do anything to win a fight because I didn't want to lose a fight, you know. And um, so I have total understanding of it from from different angles of, of assault, you know, coming up as a youth. Yeah. But these are things that have to be addressed. You know, I, I, as a youth, I got into a lot of fights and I didn't start any of them, but I was carried the court twice for assault but I, I put you know one of those dudes in the hospital and another dude didn't even show up for the court he just didn't want to get arrested by law enforcement later you know and and the one i put in the hospital was you know, you know uh, i was a teenager and he was like 30 year old biker guy with a record a mile long <laughs> but um the cops came up and 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 um you know Took, was take, took him downtown, and he wanted to press charges on me to try to switch it. He didn't even show up to court, you know. But these were youth stuff that you you would start realizing later on in life how hazardous that can, that can be as a youth and how lucky I was, one, not to get stabbed and shot at, at a young age. But the problem is now that we're, we have family, too. You, you take a lot of guys, and you're, you're somewhere with your wife and your kids, and, and, and you can get engaged into an altercation based on ego, and you're putting them at risk. You see? Yeah. So you have to learn to take the, the bodyguard mentality, meaning that I'm going to protect my family over my ego and try to keep that in check. And psychologically, what's good about training in the martial arts is the fact that in the back of your mind, you're confident enough that you can back away a little bit, you know, and not take it as hard because you're like, hey, you know what? I feel like I would totally ball this dude up and smash him. But because there's two of them, because I think that dude is, you know, he has a tail, he might be armed. I'm armed too, but I don't want to enter into a shootout with my family with me. I'm totally going to eat crow and back out of this situation as safe as I can. And um, those those sometimes are hard things for people to do, you know, when you know that, that you have another answer. And the problem of it is people get caught on their heels and they attack back and then they catch themselves in certain situations. You know, I remember a story I was training with a, a edge weapon guy years ago and uh, he was telling me a story about one of his students uh, trained edge weapons. And that's all he did. That's all this guy did. was trained the knife is, you know, uh, really good at, uh, at the edge weapon. And he got into an altercation in a bar. He was engaged 
got into a fight with a guy on, in, in, the, in the bar and uh, on the dance floor. And then somebody grabs him from behind and this other dude was hitting him while this guy grabbed him. He'd been drinking, pulls his knife out, stabs the guy behind him. The other guy backs off, right? Breaks contact. Come to find out the guy he's carved up was the bouncer. The bouncer bled to death on the dance floor. He went to jail. His, his fiance left him, you know, and he spent like 10 years in jail. Why? Because he didn't, his, his use of force, did, he didn't have a use of force. His use of force was just that. And whoever trained him in edge weapons didn't teach him proper use of force and knowing the laws of the land and the environment that he in. And due to the alcohol and being in the heat of the situation, his body reacted in the way that he was trained. And that's a, that's a problem. Now, I, I think I trained my guys in, in edge weapon offense and defense and handgun, but you have to educate them on how to deal with that stress and the laws of the land and have other ways to solve problems. Like I teach some of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu self-defense and I do it partly for lineage and partly because I really enjoy some, you know, a lot of the techniques. Some of them I, I probably wouldn't show as often as others, but I think they're good. But some of the collar grabs, I remember even doing some of my jujitsu classes and I would have, you know, some really, really well-known fighters in there. Like, say Tim Kennedy, he trained me for four and a half years in Fort Bragg, you know, why he was stationed here. One of my, one of my good friends, but we would have a phenomenal amount of fighters in there. And in some of these classes, you know, Jason Plossus and other, other guys that, that came up with me now, I would be teaching a collar grab. And then you would see the look on some of these young fighters face like, Oh fuck. Greg's teaching the collar grab. I want to do these other techniques, you know, and, and then you see some of the other guys that aren't fighters like, okay, we're doing this collar grab. We're doing this self-defense stuff. And I'm, and I said, all right, guys, and I have to do this periodically. I said, guys, why am I teaching this basic self-defense? And one of the guys was like, well, you're teaching escape the collar grab because uh, you could do that. And then you could punch him in the face or then you could hit him with an elbow. And I'm like, well, you could, but that's not that's not the answer. You know, why am I teaching how to escape somebody grabbing your collar? And nobody could answer me. And I said, well, it's based on use of force. What if a drunk female or an old man comes up and grabs your collar really tight and there's other threats coming around you and you need to be able to break contact with him to deal with something else? And the only thing you know is to elbow somebody across the face or hit them with the right cross, you're going to break that female's face or you're going to crush that old man's face. And you might win the battle, right? But you're going to go to jail. But if you have a simple way to de-escalate on the use of force continuum, this I'm breaking this grip off. I'm also prepared for them to do other stuff. And I'm not going to escalate the situation because that female or that old man that grabbed you won't be the one you're fighting. It's the two or three people that you don't see that's with them because you only knew how to smash them in the face, right? And uh, so learning to de-escalate stuff from that type of self-defense to the hand-to-hand -hand fight to getting to a force multiplier, number two pencil, handgun, and knowing how to use either one of those and to be able to bring it back down and then back up and then articulate the reasons why based on the laws of the land that you're in, you see, yeah. that's going to be another thing. Yeah. There are certain countries that, that may travel to abroad that if you're not a, a citizen of that country like Jordan, if you go to Jordan, if you're not a Jordanian, you can't carry any self-defense weapons. Some countries don't allow you to carry any knives at all. If you're running around with a little small three-inch tactical fold in your pocket, you can get in trouble for that based on, on what country you're in. So what force, you know, and then we, you know, you need to understand too what improvised force multipliers are best to carry based on the environment that you're in. Yeah. You see, uh, but that's it's a, a whole nother topic there that, that you can get into. Yeah. That's an interesting um, thing to think about. Uh, you kind of mentioned knives as a self-defense weapon. Can you maybe run down, uh, like quickly describe the pros and cons of uh, maybe pepper spray, a knife, and a gun, or maybe something else that you might consider something that somebody would carry as far as 
um, why it would be a, a, a good self-defense and maybe some of the drawbacks that it has. Gotcha. Well, what, um, I don't know if, uh, I have a knife that I designed for the special operations combative program called the SOCP dagger. There's two different daggers and then there's the rescue tool that is shaped like the dagger, but it has a seatbelt cutter with a carbide tip for breaking glass. And, um, and that's used for, you know, getting yourself out of the vehicle. If your vehicle turns over, cutting your seatbelt or extracting somebody else from a vehicle, cutting their seatbelt for safety reasons. But also it was designed to be a force multiplier for law enforcement officers. So if some of them can't carry knives, if not, law, law enforcement officers, if they stab somebody with a knife, they're going to have to really be able to justify it because it's not part of their, their everyday carry. And they, and they can be uh, held to a higher standard based on that. So sometimes it's even better for them to shoot somebody. So whatever knife they get to. But I would recommend any anybody that's carrying a firearm is they need to have a force multiplier, preferably uh, an edge weapon works better uh, to create space to retain their weapon system uh, against uh, one or two multiples. Because if you're carrying it, you're, you're obligated to be able to keep it. And if you're having to pin it down into a holster, if you have a, an edge weapon you can get to with your off hand to create space. So a lot of times the knife can be used to target certain areas that are non-lethal but painful to create space. How to, cre how to make it more painful is you don't just stab and pull it out. You stab and you do what's called stir the pot. You have one entry hole, but it's very painful. They reset their grips. You, re you reset yours. Um, with the rescue tool, you can go into the subclavin. You can fish hook with it. You can go to a lot of other places, but you also can stab with it in areas and it won't penetrate very deep, but it's going to be very painful for that. Um, with the, with the edge weapon, using it as a self-defense tool, you know, um, it, it's moving right into, in the, into the, the lethal. You're going to have to articulate it from more of the lethal perspective, meaning that you're going to probably have to show if you stab somebody legally that it was a more life or death situation, you know, um, and be able to articulate that. The problem with some of the edge weapons is, you know, can you get it out in the fight? That's the reason why the, the, the SOCP dagger has a ring on it is I can get it with either hand and I can carry it uh, a below the waistband carry and hook it with my thumb. Or it was originally designed to sit in the center of your chest for body armor for soldiers when we're fighting with all your kit on. You can scoop it out with either hand, and you can – somebody's mounted on you. You shove it in the dagger, man, and you stir the pot, and you shrimp or side mount escape with that, and you don't pull it out. You don't stab and pull it out the way they can grab it. If you're standing up from the guard, you clear the head, stab into the skull or the subclave, and then you leave it in it. You stand in face, post in the head, just like you would do in MMA to create that space. Then with, that, with the ring on it, you can still use it as a, the transition to your handgun. OC spray baton with the same hand that it's in or use it for a steady shooting platform with a handgun or a long gun. Now, other knives, the tactical folds and stuff are good, but you're going to have to practice getting them out. You know, the problem of it is with, with some of them, and, and we did this with drills with guys, it's just hard to sometimes get these weapons out once you're behind the curveball, if you're mugged, right? If they, if they do a preemptive assault on you, it's, you're going to have to be more skilled to get it out. Now, if you see it coming and you deploy the knife, the problem of it is why didn't you walk away? So, you know, that's the, that's the glitch in it, meaning that I pulled the knife out because I thought it was a threat. Then it's going to go to, okay, how did you, or how did you deploy this tactical fold in this self-defense situation? Well, it came up to me. I thought it was a problem, so I pulled my knife out and I had it already out. Then it's going to go to why didn't you walk away, right? as opposed to, under, you know, understanding that so it doesn't get used uh, against you in some, some way because you couldn't deploy, feasibly probably deployed it inside of that fight effectively. Now, maybe you could, you know, because you've got some training in doing that, um, but targeting. Now, your OC spray can be good, which a lot of law enforcement officers don't like the OC spray because they actually have to physically grab the person that they've sprayed and they have, and people come up and spray it. But I think a good, you know, tool is the OC spray as long as you have distance. You know, you have the stream, you have a mist, and you have the foam. The foam is good for more confined spaces, you know, courtrooms, uh, because it doesn't contaminate a large area. But the foam can be wiped off and then wiped on you. The mist 
is is good, but it's not going to go as far. It's going to contaminate a large area, but you're more likely to get it in their face. But wind can blow it back on you. I prefer a stream, but the problem with the stream is they may be able to see it and deflect it. And, and if they deflect and block with their hand, it still can be wiped on you. But the OC spray is, is good deterrent because if you're saying, hey, I'm going to run, this guy has a knife and I'm going to run. If you can implement some OC spray and then run, he's less likely to catch you, you see. And if you're dealing with multiple people and you have to defend yourself with an edge weapon and they have, you know, weapons as well, uh, other edge weapons, you may have to spray two or three people and do a snap cutting just to keep them at bay and then break contact from multiples, you know. Plus, your OC spray can be used in, in manners of uh, with a handgun of uh, eggs filling and spraying, and then it, then they hit the mess, go into the mess, and then you engage the threat, and then you 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 clear out of a structure that way. So there's lots of ways that the OC spray can be utilized uh, in conjunction with other tools, as batons from a self defense perspective. The problem of it is what's called the cross contamination of it getting on onto you based on the environment that you're in. And, you know, people can fight through it. Everybody who gets certified in OC spray gets sprayed, and they usually have to engage a punching bag for 30 seconds. You know, State Highway Patrol, North Carolina State Highway Patrol has to engage a bag, pull their handgun, give verbal commands, and then cuff somebody. I mean, and that's a suck factor 101. Not all OC spray affects people different. You know, you have some people that that it doesn't affect, and you got some really tough guys that I've seen when – when we were working with Fletchy there that, you know, we're tough dudes and it was really putting a hurting on them. So uh, you're not always going to get the same result from it, but it's a good tool. You know, um, uh, certain impact stuff is, you know, your batons and, and other things like that is, you know, be careful where you strike to the skull and stuff like that, that you may create a divot in the skull that creates brain swelling. So you really want to tackle more the base of the skull or the jawline, the clavicle, elbows, hands, you know, guys reaching for stuff, you smash the back of the hand, they're less likely to want to fight or reach for something. Um, so those are targets. Law enforcement usually attacks large muscle groups, but that's where you get these guys um, beating on guys and, and getting caught on camera just beating guys. The problem is they're beating down a guy that's on PCP. He doesn't feel a thing. You can smash his hand, beat him to death, and he's under under drugs and stress. And it looks like these officers are just abusing this guy, but the guy's not feeling anything, and he's still fighting. And the officers aren't, tra- aren't trained enough under stress to move to another force multiplier or realize that that baton's not having the effect. More often, they start to move to more and more aggressive strikes or multiple strikes and then trying to strike them in areas that aren't, you know, they're not qualified or, or, or they don't have the okay to because the guy's not reaching for a force multiplier is unarmed and it's getting up from the ground. So these, these are things that can happen with, with batons um, and, sh- and striking. A lot of it has to do with the weight of the batons, too. A lot of the ass batons that are out there don't have enough weight on the end, so it does a lot of tissue-type stuff. It doesn't have enough kinetic weight to give the, the real impact. And if somebody has on clothing, if it's, if it's cold weather and they have a lot of clothing on, um, it's not going to be as effective, especially somebody – under drugs or under the effects of, of adrenaline, um, enraged, uh, they can fight through a lot of this stuff. Um, but um, hopefully that answers some, some of your questions. I know I, I went pretty deep into it, but what was it you asked for uh, OC spray knives, and then you you said batons. Is that what you said? Yeah, that the yeah, just kind of a description about uh, what you did. I mean, uh, effectiveness, legal. Uh, problems or things you might run into, those sort of things that people might be, if they're carrying something, they might want to be aware of. Um, uh, a lot of interesting conversation that we don't really get into on the show. Greg, I'm thinking about somebody who is, uh, you know, want to be aware or maybe uh, nervous about like a home invasion. Uh, are there things they could do ahead of time to kind of uh, make like a, like a game plan or uh, w- would they could prepare themselves if they're worried about this sort of event? Absolutely. I mean, home invasions are something that's going to be uh, more of a thing of the future, I think. Um, more and more people are getting UPS shipments to the house. Um, other ways to rob people are getting a little bit harder to do because people may not be getting out as much. Plus, if you have, you know, hurricane, like Hurricane Katrina, where you might be in a place to where you can function, but there's no, nobody's going to be able to really get to you very effectively or law enforcement, you know, for a long time. 
if you may or may not have power. Um, so having a basic understanding to defend your dwelling, um, you know, even even inexpensively, you know, just to become less of a target is or, or key key things to have. You know, um, I, I've been thinking about stuff like that for for decades. And well, I have a, a couple houses, um, one one in the mountains of North Carolina, one down at Fort Bragg. And um, they're both set up a little bit different. You know, key things that you have to be aware of is, is you want to make sure you're, you know, less of a target. Um, you know, things that you can do for that is have have signs that say, hey, you know, alarm system, even if you don't have an alarm or cameras, even if you don't have cameras. If you can have some kind of alarm system, and they're relatively cheap now, um, that way you have panic buttons you can hit. If, if the house, you know, gets assaulted or, you know, some breaks in, or if there's even a fire, being able to get somebody on the other line, you know, uh, linking to them is, is really important. Uh, there's also inexpensive systems that are just uh, manually hook, hooked up with monthly fees, but you could have them in an apartment or a dorm room or anywhere. You could take them for an emergency uh, panic button to be able to hit for whatever reason. Um, other things that are a little bit unconventional, um, a large dog bowl uh, out front at the front door. So if someone comes up, they would assume that you have a, a large dog uh, could be a deterrent, uh, if, even if you don't have one. Even if you have a small dog, you may want to entertain the idea of getting a larger <laughs> bowl uh, to kind of, you know, deter. Um, any kind of sensor device for someone coming up, like I, the house that I have in the mountains, I have a gate, but if that gate's open, there's a beep happens in front of the house so I know if someone's coming, plus I don't have a lot of stuff shipped to the house. Um, I have them shipped to, to another place. The house in Vast, a lot of stuff can be dropped off there, but it's a gated community. Um, so if you have packages coming, Amazon or whatnot, be aware that they're coming. To, um, now, talking about the, the front door, most assaults or, or, or burglaries actually happen from the front door, and a lot of them happen during the day. They may ring the doorbell to see if somebody's home and then make entry. Um, so sometimes even acknowledging, you know, can be good because they may break in or decide not to break in based on somebody being there. But you're going to have to figure, you know, figure that out. You need a peephole to look through or a camera system. Uh, and then if, if somebody, you know, you look through and see someone you don't know, you know, ask them, hey, you know, who is it? How can I help you? And keep them on the other side of the door, you know. Um, and then if it doesn't feel right, just say, hey, you know, you have to come back later or most of the time, you know, it's usually a package. It used to be, years ago, it was gas. Hey, I ran out of gas. Can I use your phone? Now it's becomes because of Amazon and so many people get, hey, I have a package. And then you ask them, well, who's the package for? If they can't say your name or somebody's name, then there's a problem, right? Um, they may see your uh, last name on the front of the house, but you may not want to put your last name on the front of the house for these reasons. Just leave the number in bold. So law enforcement agencies can get to your house in emergency two or fire. So you want big numbers, road numbers there so they can tell this is your house. But you may not want, you know, Thompson up, blasted up everywhere because then they could use that to create a dialogue um, to be able to gain, you know, to gain some uh, some access. But so those are things to think about. Um, other ways is to have ways to wedge the door. I'm not, you know, there, unless you have a metal frame door and a metal door, a lot of household doors are real easy to kick in, even with the deadbolt. And these little bitty chains that you open up and peek through the chains, th those are nothing to break through unless you have, you know, some metal framework and a metal door. So those uh, rods that you can buy that kind of wedge the doorknob into the ground are really good. Um, also, the wedges that go into the flooring system can be a little bit better. Reinforcing your door would be good. Also, if you don't have that, um, door stops, you know, um, your standard door stops. So when the door, if you need to wedge it slightly to look out or something, you have a door stop there uh, to kind of wedge or improvise door stops by using tennis shoes and some kind of hard object that will ramp it up on the shoe when the door goes to open most, you know, uh, front doors open inward, inward swinging doors. So understand, you know, where, what direction your door swings on how to block doors. Um, other, um, other things, if you do have to fight at the door to push somebody out, you know, um, a lot of times people just push on the door, but stepping on the actual 
uh, putting your foot at the door, especially with the rubber shoes on, can make it really hard for a stronger person to push it open, even though you're weak, or by just putting a lot of weight down and then leaning into the door, uh, kind of wedging it with your own shoe at the time. And that can buy you a little time to, you know, get help or tell someone else to, uh, you know, move to get to a weapon system or, or to run or, or, or convey some kind of information. Um, if you are going to fight, you know, uh, it's better to do it right there uh, in the doorway. Um, also to have improvised or, or, or primary or improvised weapons there. Um, I've, I've got spread out throughout my house several lock boxes that are, you know, covered up with something. It could be a blanket in a cabinet, or I've got one that is a handgun, a quick lock box, but I've got another cardboard box over top of it. So if you just look into that cabinet, you would just see a box, but you didn't know if you flip that box up, um, there's a lock box there with a handgun in it. You know, for close quarter grappling situations, I like a, a snub nose revolver hammerless because it's really hard for somebody to induce some malfunction on that. And I can leave it wrapped up in some cloth or, you know, or another bag and shoot through that bag multiple shots uh, up close. I also have that my, my wife's purse and her my sister-in-law's purse. They both have some of those revolvers, and I've educated them on reaching in your purse, firing the weapon system in, from inside the purse. If they grab the purse and try to deflect it, then you just slide your hand right out of the purse and engage the threat again. Um, so have the weapons there. If you don't, or if you're not allowed to have firearms or don't have firearms, you know, hammer, screwdriver, hornet spray, uh, things like that can uh, be used very effectively um, given your, your skill level. Um, some of your handgun, you know, if they're coming in the door and brandishing the weapon, uh, you know, and making mistakes like that, you might be able to use some of your self-defense techniques to get to the weapon system. The problem is with home invasions, it's usually not one individual. Uh, it's usually, you know, more on the videos and, and stuff that I've seen of home invasions. Um, and usually it's somebody knocks at the door and then they, you know, proceed to push their way in from there. Um, so being able to get to a force multiplier, you may scrap a little bit to buy time for your family um, based on the aggressiveness of, of the of the assaulters, you know. Um, your next layer from, from the door, from it being barricaded, is to have, you know, some kind of go bag or something you can try to scramble to get to. Um, be able to communicate with people that there is a threat, if there's a fire or if it's a home invasion, so they have a plan on where to, that they may be able to exit the house and go to a safe place, maybe a neighbor, another another spot uh, that they can get to. If you've got, I've got it, several go, go bags spread out, um, and, and even my father, he's got a garage, you know, probably 100 yards behind a house in, in a real a rural area, and uh, he's got a handgun out there because he's had people show up and he, he felt like he was, you know, wouldn't be able to defend himself. So in spots like that, having a lot box in other places, just in case, depending on where you're at, you know, this tactic doesn't work for everybody, but, um, you know, in, in your lot box, you know, flashlight, some, some kind of communication device. And I'm also big on some kind of first aid, even if it's just a long scarf or bandana that you can use as compression wrap, uh, like a tourniquet, because, if you end up in some kind of hostile situation from uh, a, a shot, a ricochet, a splash, you know, somebody shooting through a doorway and hitting you in the arm, you know, and you're having to run, you're going to need to stop this bleeding on you or someone else because law enforcement support is not going to get there. You know, uh, it's going to at least take 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes before somebody gets there. And then, you know, uh, somebody there, you know, rescue or or medical is not going to get there till they secure the area, then that could take some time. So if you're hunkered down somewhere, you know, it could be a while. So, you know, have some means of setting a makeshift uh, tourniquet on a leg or an arm or compression wrap, and understanding of that would be crucial, even if it's an edge weapon or whatever it might be so you don't bleed out or someone you care about doesn't bleed out, you know. So, and it's just easy to have that kind of stuff with you. But um, I guess, you know, some some kind of first aid, you know, uh, weapon, a flashlight, and uh, communication. Communication is key because, you know, if somebody breaks in, you got a panic button. That's priceless because you know somebody's coming. And, and you know, you're not going to always be able to have your phone right there to communicate exactly where you're at and what's going on. So a lot of the panic buttons from alarm systems are set to your, your address. Um, 
and that's going to be a deterrent in itself. Now, if you're having to exhale back, you know, you would try to get first get your family, you know, out of there if you have the opportunity to uh, get back or, you know, you exhale, get them out of there, um, get them to a safe place. If you want to double back and engage the threat when they exit the house, that's kind of up to you if you've got a weapon or if you disable their vehicle when they're in the house. And then you have uh, video or, uh, is real good. You know, you can take photos with your phone, but just keep the video running. License plate, make, model. Maybe get a video of them leaving the house with your stuff and not even engage them at all might be an option as well. You know, if you take your family to the neighbors and it's the only house is next door, if you disable their vehicle, they're probably going to go next door and try to take that house down. So tech, things like that have to be thought, thought about. Now, if you can't exit the, the house, you know, um, I set up a safe in a gun safe that's metal um, in in the room, and I set it up in a way that there's another spot to hide behind it. So when you open up the actual door to the safe, which is uh, you know thick steel, that's going to be your cover. You and I have my wife where she, we have what's called a circuit judge. It's a revolver 410 uh, with a laser sight and a light on the front if needed. But I've instructed her to take a, a really high beam light. It's, it's about 500 looms. Set it on the bed, and it'll face the entryway. And then she's going to open up the safe if she can have the kids behind her and lock down right there with that 410 revolver with alternating, you know, uh, spreads from a, a slug or, or and mi mixing up the rounds. And um, also a closet door will swing open. So if they breach the bedroom door, which we actually have a, a large rod that will lock that bedroom door down a little bit, but it will take a little time to get through it. Then when they come through there, they're going to have to move a closet door open. Now, you can shoot through it. If they're pounding on your door, you know, engage through the door, and that's where you want certain rounds to penetrate. And then at certain times, you may not want rounds to penetrate, so kind of know what your rounds are uh, when you're firing your, your uh, rifle. That's what's good about having a shotgun. Uh, inside for home defense is you can alternate rounds or know what rounds are going to be, you know, penetration rounds and not penetration so you don't, you know, shoot someone that doesn't deserve it. Um, so you can engage them that way. And, and with the light being on the bed in a different spot than where you're at, you're also creating, a, you know, concealment because if all the lights are off in the room, the light's off, you know, five or six feet off in the corner shining directly at them. It's going to be really hard for them to be able to see you, and then you're still bunkered behind some steel plates of the safe, and then you start engaging there. And uh, that can propose a whole other problem for, you know, someone invading your home, and then that way it can buy you time until you can call someone to get someone there. But um, my recommendation would be to exit the home uh, if you can. If not, set up some kind of barricade. Other easy barricades uh, or inexpensive barricades may not be that easy, but sheets of metal, you can um, quarter inch, or if it's real heavy for you to maneuver, get quarter or eighth inch sheets of metal and uh, layer, layer uh, some plyboard between them and uh, put that in uh, like a closet or another wall that it's hard for somebody to shoot through or reinforce some doors. Or you could also have that to where you could lift it or unfold it from a wall. It could be laying against the wall and you roll it out in front of you. Um, and that's going to be your, you know, uh, concealment uh, for engaging a threat when you can't, you know, uh, exfil out. So you would create your own bulletproof, uh, you know, barrier. And uh, by layering it, you know, with a eighth of an inch or quarter inch steel, um, when a, a round hits it, it's going to start expanding, and then the five would force it to, to start slowing down, and then the other layer would uh, more, you know, more likely to stop the round. There are certain penetration rounds that will shoot through stuff like that, but um, most you know, home invasions may not be running with such high-powered rounds, and most of those rounds you know, are hard to get a hold of and, and are illegal in uh, most states. Um, that's kind of a, a quick uh, rundown of, of what to do on home invasion. Also, is un understand ways to barricade. You know, doors can be real important, too, if it's inward or outward swinging uh, bedrooms. Um, you know, you can tie stuff. If it's an outward swinging door, you can tie it, tie the knob off to something solid in the room uh, so it can only pull so far or use a coat hanger to wrap around the doorknob. 
and then secure it to something else or put a, a, a rod perpendicular to it and tie it off to that rod and that way it won't open up uh, until, you, until you untie it. Inward, inward swinging doors, you want to wedge. You also could prep your house to, um, to where uh, dresses could fall down and block doors. So I would have the dresses drop to where it may fall against another object so they're at a, at a 90 degree angle of the door really hard to move or filing cabinets in an office or something like that that could easily be turned over and it makes it really hard for somebody to get get in there and then cut cut off the light source um would be key things uh to do as well um and then also um reflective glass or mirrors in hallways so you can actually use reflection um to look in different areas inside of your house from being in one spot without sticking your head out and just see what's going on. Uh, it's also good for keeping an eye on your kids. Uh, inexpensive, uh, you know, instead of having a camera system, you just set up glass with the lighting the right way. It's going to reflect down, and you'll be able to see in different locations um, based on that or mirrors. Um, but, you know, it's, it's how far do you want to take it. There's, you know, dozens and dozens of things that you can do for what I call you know, combative feng shui, you know, uh, for the house. You know, you got to have a certain certain way to lay things out. But um, anyway, I hope that helps. Um, any questions or comments on some of that information? Well, that, that that is a lot of information to take in. I think one of the biggest things is to tend to take this information in and then try to plug in the ideas to your own uh, living environment or even workspace, you know, uh, and try to just think, okay, he said something about blocking the door. How would I do that? And Because every door is going to be different. Every house is laid out differently, and different people have different tools and different uh, things that they want to do. But uh, take the ideas and kind of try to plug them into what you have at home. Exactly, because nothing's, nothing's ever the same, and nothing's going to go down the way you want it to. We We talk about these things, and we discuss them to have kind of a – play the odds but when things go down for real they never go down quite the way you envisioned it in your head nothing does um you you try to uh but by having some of these things then you can pick what's going to work better better for for you and the individual and the environment that you're in and i think you know communication and creating safe habits is key you know if somebody knocks at your door look condition yourself and habits to look through the peephole you know, if you don't know who it is, don't feel like you've got to open up the door. You know, now, if you want to open up the door, you know, wedge it with your foot, have, and you don't know who they are, you know, have an intermediate weapon on you or right there. Just say, hey, I'll be back in a minute, you know, depending on where you're at and, and, and given the situation. Um, and, and it's better. You have to create habits because, you know, no one's not enough. You know, you can know all this stuff, but if you don't create habits, these things will slip past you. And you won't realize it, you know. It's even, you know, I, 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 you know, for me with all the training I have, people think that I'm, you know, paranoid. I fuss on my wife for looking. You need to get in the habit of looking to see who's there. You just opened up the door, didn't even know who, who was there, you know. And it really irritates me because I'm not, you know, more than likely I'm not going to be there. You know, the odds are, you know, these things are going to happen. If you don't, you know, help people around you create safe habits for them on a day-to-day thing, then they're going to be, more of a target, you know, uh, even for, you know, vehicle assaults, you know, uh, and, and stuff like that, you know, keeping your doors locked, you know, and, and those things and, and, you know, keeping certain distance from cars in front so you can drive around, uh, awareness of, of people coming up to your vehicle and stuff like that. Just a few little habits like that can make it, make you a lot, make, keep you a lot safer, you know? Yeah. It, and I, you talked a little bit about deterrence and that's a big one. Um, you know, people think, yeah, if this happened, I would take care of it. I would, you know, take the person out. And even if somebody is trying to break in your house and you, uh, successfully defend, uh, your house and your, you know, family that's in there, it's still probably going to rank somewhere on the top 10 of your worst days of your life. As far as if you had to kill somebody in your own house, you know, like just to not have that day happen with a good deterrent, like even just like the big dog bowl, I never thought about that. that's kind of a, uh, an easy one to do. Even if you have a small dog, you know, give them a big bowl, make it a big dog in their eyes. And, and those types of things, uh, 
to deter this type of activity is a, uh, is a huge thing that you'll never really know that pays off, but, uh, you'll be happy it did. Yeah. Yeah. So the key thing is create habits and, and, and just stick to them, you know? I'll go with that. How could somebody train with you or um, contact you? Well, that, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is I don't have courses for civilians right, you know, right now I've, I've only train law enforcement and military. Um, my, my, I run a gym team rock and, and, uh, Fayetteville, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, um, where we do jujitsu uh, and MMA, and um, we do mix it up a little bit. But I don't show. I'm so busy traveling right now. I mean, I'm I'm traveling all over the country. I'm headed to Sweden this month, and um, traveling all all over the place with the SOTP program and developing programs for other agencies, uh, federal and state. That uh, when I show up to teach jiu-jitsu or, or any of the classes, they pretty much call it a seminar, you know, but I do have criteria that I want a lot of my instructors to teach, you know, that's there, but, you know, unfortunately, I don't, I'm not open, to, nothing that I do is open to the public, okay. you know, um, ba- based on a lot of the, the, the units that I work with, it's just not feasible to put civilians in there, and as you could tell by the way the subject kept changing, if when the guys go through my combative training stuff, they need to understand tactics before they come to me because I'm not going to teach fundamental CQB and tactics. They have to know it before they come and they have to have a basic understanding of, of use of force continuum from law enforcement. If not, it's, I'm not going back to first grade and I'm not qualified to teach everybody's tactics or anybody's tactics for that matter. Um, at the level that, that I'm going to want them to be at when they come. Um, so that's kind of been for the last decade, that's just been my, my focus, you know, uh, t- 10 years ago, I was kind of training everybody and I almost went more the route of training fighters and, and sticking in that route. But, um, I got passionate about this subject of, of linking, you know, combatives to force multipliers, the use of force continuum. And, you know, we, I encourage all my students though, law enforcement, military, um, to find a good gym, you know, find a good MMA, jiu-jitsu gym, wherever you're at. I don't care what, you know, Baja, Alliance, you know, Horse Gracie, Net, whatever it might be, find a good gym that you get along with the guys and just start training and, um, and make the adjustments and, and understand weapons and uh, under, understand how to train, you know, the ways we discussed. Uh, and think about it. I challenge them to do that. If, you know, in a law enforcement office, by the time they go through my course, they, they really get into it. You know, I had a guy when I was training, uh, working with the ATF, the ATF adopted stock P for all their, um, SRT, uh, teams. And I would spend a week with all the five teams usually a- annually. And one of the guys, several guys did not like combatives at all, you know, and then one or two of the guys after training with me, even though we didn't do a lot of stuff on the ground, just hearing me talk and showing various things, they decided to join a gym. And, and uh, like a year ago, the guy uh, bumped into him in one of our research, like, hey, Greg, I started training at this gym. I just got my blue belt. And, uh, and you know, I was like, well, good deal. You know, and it motivates guys. So a lot of times when I get these guys that are, hey, I'll just shoot them, I'm more of a, of a, of a you know, that type of perspective from the law enforcement military side. By the time they go through the stock P and I, and I force them to do clinch fighting for their weapons and fight over these objects. They realize where they're, they're really vulnerable at. They end up going into training in jujitsu and some MMA grappling type gyms. And, uh, so it's kind of like a, you know, feeds, feeds them out there, you know, to these other schools, uh, across the country, you know? Yeah. But, uh, that's uh, unfortunately, I don't, you know, I don't have anything for me. And it's, I've got, uh, you know, several, I've got the H2H, uh, soldiers edition. Okay. It was published a decade ago. Those some stuff I've got, you know, my, uh, stock P dagger, which I'm probably going to end up doing a manual for that this summer. Um, combat cubes, which you fight around. Uh, if you go to TX combatives.com, you can see my impact suits. The, the impact suits we have are, are padded suits. Mine has face recognition on the front. So you can, dial the situation up or down based on on who you're fighting male female um is it the person you're looking for um and then there's pockets in the back to conceal weapons and knives uh on the chest piece and the pants 
and then the the front belly piece folds down to, to velcro other stuff to it or attach other paddings for when we do knee strikes to the groin or when we do sims in the clinch fight we're usually shooting at the at cracking the pretzel of the hip so we'll do a lot of close in shooting with sims pistols there the helmet um that fits really tight as a metal cage to the front anti-fog um so the, those equip that equipment's there for the law enforcement and military uh, at that side. We're, we're, we're constantly evolving equipment based on what, what we need to do the training. When I see their training starting to progress and I need a tool that's not out there, and now I have the ability to manufacture that, you know, that object. You know, one of, one of the things I designed a while back, and some people may have remember it, was the, something called the defense band which was a, a self-defense watch band that you would do a Ezekiel choke with. I developed it back in uh, 2000, did a lot of air marshal stuff with it. But I took that off. Uh, I don't sell that anymore. I kind of give it to the students because of liability. You know, um, it's too easy to get sued this day and time when you have a device designed to choke people. So <laughs> it's um, something that I try, even though there's disclaimers, you don't know what anybody's going to do. And once you start to make a little bit of money, you become a target, you know, so the the margins aren't worth uh, the potential risk with something like that. But it was based off of off of a sleeve, you know, Ezekiel choke, a sleeve choke in jujitsu. Um, but there's a whole system that I, you know, mess around with that. But um, those are some of the stuff, some of the things that I, you know, have out there. But um, so I, and also to five eleven did some videos with me where I showed some edge weapon defense and, uh, um, the, they, uh, have three or four videos where they shot, uh, one, one, one of them they did was called one minute lesson. I showed some stuff and another one's about three or four minutes long. Um, that's probably about the only educational stuff that I've actually put out on the, on, you know, out to the public to see a lot of the techniques and, tactics that we do is it's kind of frowned upon to to blast this stuff out there and what a lot of people uh in the civilian world don't really know is that some of these guys if they really start marking it out to everybody it's it's not they're probably not dealing with the the higher echelon of of the military or the federal agencies because they just don't want people blasting yeah a lot of putting a lot of information out there um so you, you end up getting guys that used to be there or they may float in and work with an agency for like three or four days and may work with this you know unit for a day or two but they're not the ones there every day you know day in and day out that they go back to the setup stuff you know so um I, that's the reason why i don't really push much out and i'm not going to push anything out uh to the public it's, it's you know some things need to be little little close knit you know i've explained some of the drills that we do in philosophies but uh, a lot of it's just primarily for the courses uh that i'm running in settle you know federal state and military training so if you want to if you want to join the army or, or become a cop and uh and i work with you <laughs> great we've, we've talked about a lot of things i have a, a page of notes here with other many other questions uh, we're going a, a little long today, but I do have, uh, I think, a, an interesting question for you. If somebody, let's just put them at blue belt level, and they just got, you know, the, a police officer job, and they're they're in the academy learning their the combatives program there, or uh, that same blue belt person just got in with the military, and they're getting ready to learn the hand to hand uh, combat. What advice do you have for them to, you know, to take what they have or maybe just leave it all behind and learn everything. But for that blue belt entering into um, these situations, as far as making the best of their training. Well, I think they're going to have a definite advantage, you know, uh, in no matter what agency they go to, I mean, a blue belt, you know, um, he, he's going to be, uh, if, as long as it's a, it's a reputable black belt gave it to him. I mean, he's going to be at the higher percentage skill level, uh, in combatives in, in any of these places, most of these places. Now, um, certain units that I have have guys at a black belt level in, in jiu-jitsu and have fought even professionally in, um, at the highest level like your Tim Kennedy's, but they're very few and far between. Um, I think their jiu-jitsu will help them. I would, I would still show up with, uh, with an empty plate, you know, and, and 
and they will see a lot of the stuff that they've already learned come in, come into play, but learn it from the perspective of that individual, you know, uh, and it's about understanding perspective as opposed to, in, a, in conjunction with new techniques. And that's what people don't understand when they go train with people is a lot of times they're only looking at it from their perspective, meaning that I'm only, only going to this jujitsu class because I want to be an MMA fighter or I'm only going to this jujitsu class for self-defense or sport jujitsu or whatever. And so when the, when the topic goes into something that they don't, they may not have had an experience needing, then they, they don't listen, listen, listen and, and take it in and truly understand the perspective of where each system or discipline fits uh, the situation. And, and most of the time, in, in the jiu-jitsu world, that's that's not a problem, you know, this day and time. Um, you know, decades ago, there were issues with it. But but now, you know, majority of all blue belts, you know, know they don't have all the answers. And, and majority of all, you know, jiu-jitsu black belts should know they don't have all the answers. And, and then that, when you train long enough, you learn that nobody has all the answers. You know, the answers are always changing, you know, because environments change and situations change that – no, you know, if, if you're not evolving and, and always a student, then then you're falling behind. You know, um, what's going on? Well, that's so great. Ho- hopefully, that helps. Yeah, yeah. That, that's great advice. Uh, I'm gonna let you go. Do you have any final thoughts or uh, a message you want to uh, tell the audience? No, I, I've just enjoyed the conversation. You know, um, I, I'm glad that that I was able to to help and hopefully some of the guys with a more of a jujitsu perspective, you know, can get something out of, out of our discussion. And, um, they, they probably did, or they would have probably cut this conversation short an hour ago and realized that that I might be talking about something that they're not in receiving mode for, but, um, challenge them to, to look and, and to, uh, expand their game outside of, of what they're doing now, you know, uh, but stay training. You know, that that's the key is just stay active, stay in the groove. You know, for the older guys like me, you start to get old and, and you realize you can't show up and and, uh, and be the dog all the time. So find ways to not to get injured, you know, and, uh, and to stay training uh, w- would be the key, I think. All right. I love it. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank you. And uh, thanks for having me. Uh, on, on your show. Well, I'd like to thank Greg for uh, coming on to our show and uh, sharing some great advice. And, you know, the, the two things that, you know, well, more, way more than two things I took from it, but, you know, I, I really like the part about de-escalating situations. Um, you know, it's, I'm not looking to get in a fight. I'm looking to, uh, um, you know, find a way out of that fight where I'm not going to be injured uh, and the attacker will not be injured and everybody's going to be safe. I really don't want to fight. I'm only going to fight if I have to. Um, but I also like, you know, where you need to be aware of your surroundings. You need to be aware of all that. Um, but, you know, I'm going to try to de-escalate the situation. And I also like uh, the party talks about, you know, how to prevent like home evasions, how to make it so, you know, your house isn't the target, you know, so make it harder for people to break in. And, you know, that's one, uh, you know, thing I've always thought about, I've always been reading about. And uh, it's just good to hear from, uh, you know, an expert like himself. Yeah, simple things like uh, having, you know, you have a dog and like, like my dog is not that big of a dog. But if if I have a water bowl out for my dog on like the front porch or somewhere out front uh, for the dog uh, to drink water while I'm mowing, why not get like the biggest dog bowl that there is? And that way when someone's coming up to kind of case my house, man, that guy's got a huge dog in there. I think I'm going to pass on this guy's house, <laughs> Yeah, you know, or yep. get, get even a sign that says home security. They'll go to a house yep. that doesn't have that sign. Even if you don't have that, you know, that's not something that, that you have. Uh, that might just be the deterrent that keeps anything from happening to you and, and your house or your family or get a security system and, and getting that panic button and, and, and also kind of like preparing stuff by your door a little bit to where – if, uh, you know, something does happen, it's, you know, it's a decent chance it'll happen at the door. And he, he referenced, you know, like it used to be somebody knocking door, hey, I ran out of gas. You know, can you help me out? And then as a total stranger, you have to open your door and talk to him. That's like the old way. Now it's, hey, will you sign for this package? You know, I have a package for you. 
but we order stuff online all the time. You know, you may not even know that sometimes like we get a package. I have no idea what it is. You know, maybe my wife bought something or maybe vice versa. My wife's like, Oh, you know, buy an order something. It's some big package. I could be, you know, I don't want it to not be delivered. So I better sign for that thing. Now that's a, that could be a fake thing. So you could ask them, you know, whose name's on the package. And if they can't tell you your the, the, the full name of the person, you probably have a problem. You know, like that, that may not be a safe person to open it the door for so just some good quality advice like think about things before you act and and that'll help you act properly yeah definitely uh you know great advice uh, uh, um you know i'm gonna definitely listen to this again because uh, i know uh, like like you said it's a little longer episode and i know there's some stuff i probably missed and uh, i'm def- definitely gonna hit it again just to uh, grab a little bit more this week, we have an email of the week instead of an article of the week. So it's kind of a, a first, and it took us 187 episodes to get the email of the week. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing good on that. But yep. hey, one of our listeners, uh, John, sent us in a uh, uh, email. And in the email, he kind of talks about the 80-20 rule um, and the, the 1% rule. And you know what he was talking about is uh, – is our quote where we always talk about the, uh, uh, you know, the BJJ brick technique. And, you know, we talk about a brick is a, is a move that, you know, we're really good at where it's our fallback move, something that we're really, really familiar with it. And, uh, you know what, uh, John was saying, and he was thinking that the, the 1% rule, uh, from James clear is a good theory to back up the, the BJJ brick technique. And, you know, and, and what he talks about is just being a little bit better than your competition. It's not like you have to be twice as good as your competition. You just need to be a little bit better. It's the 1% rule. And we put a link to uh, James Clear, um, the 1% rule. But basically what he's saying is I don't have to you know, be twice as good as Byron. When we're in a jiu-jitsu match, it, it's basically winner take all. I just have to perform a little bit better than Byron, and uh, you know I'm going to get the win. Um, you know, same thing. You know, let's say in a working situation. You know, let's say uh, you have a marketing proposal and you're trying to uh, uh, you know gain a client, and you know they've got you know 10, 15 different companies. I just have to be a little bit better than all those other companies, and I get 100 percent of that contract. You know, I'm going to win and uh, I get that contract. I'm going to have more business. So, uh, you know, it's something, you know, pretty cool. The, the winner gets it and the rest of the people, they get absolutely nothing. Yeah, it, I haven't really thought about I know the 80-20 rule, you know, like 80% of uh, the victories at the gold medals are going to be collected by about 20% of the people who are out there trying to get them. And, and, and this rule applies to a lot of the things. 80% of your customers – uh, or eighty percent of the money you make as a business is going to be provided by about twenty percent of your customers. So, it, the, like the rule pops up a lot, and it's not necessarily something that needs to be exact, but it's more of an idea of look for the the small percentage of people that are uh, taking care of like the main the big part of something, and uh, the rule you see it all over the place. But the, this one percent idea, you just need to be a little bit better than the person you're competing against. And that little bit creates a huge margin of victory. Either in jujitsu, either you win or you lose. There's not like a special category for you barely won. You you got the gold medal or you got the silver medal. That's it. And so if you got the gold medal and it was by 1% better or by an advantage or something like that, the gold medal is still the same thing. And that's still a victory. So uh, this the idea is very interesting to me. So you can even break this down into different categories of your game. You might be 1% more technical, and that might be the edge you need. Maybe maybe you're down a little bit on technical side of things. Maybe you're 1% uh, better in the cardio aspect of jiu-jitsu, and you're just ready to push the pace on that person. And you end up beating somebody who technically may be better because you brought cardio in as a big factor, and you really got them tired. That 1% was able to take over in that subcategory of your jiu-jitsu game, and you're able to get the win there. Maybe you're 1% better with just mentally being ready to where they throw everything they have at you, and nothing stuck, and you're still coming at them confident and aggressively, and you just break them mentally, and that 1% edge could be the victory. So, And then, of course, 
there's that one percent, you know, better at guard passing, one percent better at, you know, defending something, one percent better at, you know, a certain particular attack than they are at defending. If Gary's one percent better at finishing his triangle choke than I am at defending his triangle choke, he's going to get me with it. I mean, that's it, it's, it's a very interesting. Like, it just tips the scale slightly, and it makes a huge difference. So you can think about that on multiple aspects of your grappling. Yeah, it, it's funny because I, I never really thought of it that way. Um, and, you know, it even goes back to like the 80-20 rule too. Like, you know, let's say I, I'm just a little bit, you know, I've got those submissions that I'm, I'm a little bit better than. And the majority of my submissions are going to come from that move or, or those two moves. Um, you know, I just get better. And, uh, you know, like uh, John says, the uh, the margin between good and great is narrower than it seems. It's it's not like I just have to be a, a flat out stud who is a hundred times better than you and everything. I mean, look at Byron. I mean, just look at the guy. I mean, <laughs> but um, you start feeling you know, sorry th- for me then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you get on the mat. The one thing Byron severely lacks, and I mean, we're not just talking one percent, is brains. Yeah, I mean, he's way way behind in everybody else, but. Cardio is very good. <laughs> Strength is very good. Technique is very good. Um, you know, he's 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 got a lot of things that are really good. And audio and even editing is decent. Audio <laughs> is okay. Is average, a uh, little below average. But you know, he he's really good at a lot of those things, and you know, it just keeps adding up. Um, you know, he starts out, you know, with just a slight edge over the competition, but each each time he goes, you know, it just keeps compounding. So. Uh, um, you know, it's a, this was really unique. I had never really thought of anything like that. And, um, Byron kind of sent it to me during my work day, um, to prepare for our recording here. And, and I actually passed it around to my team at work and, you know, just talked about work. You know, we don't have to be, you know, this much better than our, our competition. We, we only have to be a little bit better, but it's not that we're not going to strive. I want to strive to be you know, a hundred percent better than everybody else and, and this and that, but it, it's kind of neat. You know, it's like, I, I want to outwork them. I want to outwork them and get a, a little bit better than, you know, my competition at work, my competition on the mat, you know, my competition on the basketball court. And, uh, and I, I don't know, it's just a, a really cool, uh, cool email, uh, slash article. Yeah. If, if you look back and at a loss, you know, did you lose by a slim margin? I mean, obviously you can go out there and you can get just, you just take a loss bad. I mean, there's nothing you could do to beat that person. You could be, uh, you know, a white belt and you're competing against somebody who's basically a blue belt. They'll be getting it tomorrow or they'll be getting on the podium. And they're really, you know, a pretty decent blue belt already at that. And and so nothing you were going to be able to do is going to be able to beat that person. Uh, not that that's the case, but just somebody who you could fight 10 times, they're probably going to beat you, you know, nine or 10 of those times. And it, that type of a loss, you know, there's really not a whole lot you can do. But if you look back and you lost by that 1% margin, you lost a very close match. Did you give like all of your effort and make this like the best match you could possibly do? And you came up 1% short, then you could live with that. If you, uh, you know, kind of, you know, didn't do things quite right. You didn't, you didn't fight as hard as you could maybe. And you lost by a very slim margin. That's, that's a hard way to take a loss because you could have always tried a little bit harder. And, uh, you don't want to lose by that slim margin when you have in the back of your mind. Yes, I could have pushed a little bit harder. Yes. I still had some uh, gas in the tank when this was over. And I don't know what I saved it for. You know, I just, I just did, you know, so be considering that. And also, you know, are you treating 1% harder than your competition? Sure. It'd be great to train like twice as hard, but, uh, you know, you got to be to buy at least, you know, a percent of win. So, uh, yeah, I never really thought of this. You know, it is winner take all elections, you know, so much, you know, you either win an election or you don't win an election. It doesn't matter how much you win it by, uh, you know, in business, either you win like a new client or somebody else wins a new client. Once you win that person or that, that business, it, it doesn't matter that it was by a slim margin. They could be your customer for years. And so, yeah, it's it's an interesting article. You can apply it to everything, I think. <laughs> Maybe not everything. You can apply it to a lot of stuff in life. And, uh, yeah, I never thought about 1% being such a huge difference, but it often is. Yeah, and I think about it from a losing standpoint also. You know, it's like, man, I've lost, you know, a couple matches in a row. I'm not, you know, doing very well. But in all reality, 
there's a good chance that margin is really, really narrow. It's unless, like you said, you just got, you know, mopped, you know, the guy mopped the floor with you. But, you know, it's, you know, even if you're losing, you think that there's probably a very slim margin. Like, don't give up. Don't quit. It's, you know, you just have a little bit. You just have to gain to get to that point. And then the other part I think about it is every time Byron beats me, I'm just going to look him right in the eye and just say, Byron, you're only 1% better than me. That's no big deal. <laughs> so, yeah, I took a lot of, a lot of good stuff out of this article. Yeah. That, it, it's very interesting that he sent this as an email and I, t- and I messaged him back and said, Hey, man, I definitely want to talk about this on the podcast. And I think I want to throw it up on our website as like a little mini article, if that's cool. And John said yes. So, uh, there'll be a link to the article he references and there'll be a link to what he sent us as well on our own website. So uh, thanks very much, John, you, you know, uh, a listener. And when you have something like that uh, and you share it, we appreciate it a ton. So if you have something like that, you want to get a hold of us, bgjbrick at gmail.com is how John did it. And that's how uh, you could do that as well. Yep. And I'm telling you, we, we love having people like John send us stuff. And I know we've had Joe Thomas on the show and, and a lot of the people that, uh, you know, listen to our show that send us stuff. We're going to put it on the show. You know, the other thing is Byron and I were talking about, you know, we're not the brightest guys in the world and we can get a little bit lazy. We do not want to scour around looking for articles and uh we just love it when uh somebody who listens to the show sends an article to us and uh it, you know it kills two birds with one stone it keeps us from having to find one but the best part is you know it's it involves you guys we can't have a show without uh you people listening and and we want to just you know it's like a back and forth discussion we want to want to have your stuff and and use you know your articles if gary uh there are a few ways that many can support the podcast uh, financially, uh, one of them is to buy the audiobook. Really hope that you do that for yourself if you are in your first year and you're needing a little bit of, uh, help or guidance or maybe you just want to hear what we have to say about grappling your first year and how to get better. Uh, another way is to find us on Patreon. It's a website for people that make content like podcasts or artwork or music or something like that. We make podcasts, Gary. And so that's where people are helping us out there. We've got a new Patreon supporter. Goodrin, and a really big thank you to Goodrin for hopping on here and supporting us. Every new Patreon supporter is definitely appreciated, and uh, thank you so much for hopping on here, giving us some support. There's a couple different ways you could do it on there. You could support us like a dollar per episode or up to three dollars per episode, and from there, it you know basically. You can set a limit. You know, if you if there's five episodes in a month, you only want to support for four. That's fine. It just kind of uh, it'll charge you at the beginning of the next month. And if you sign up and support us, we'll send you a five inch BJJ Brick Gee Patch as a token of support. So thank you so much for everyone on there. This uh, Patreon thing has had kind of a rough start. Is I feel like it's getting a little bit more traction. And the people who are on there really mean a ton to us. So thank you, Goodrun, for, for hopping on there and and helping us out. And it means a lot. And we look forward to uh, continued support. So if you're interested in helping us out, check out the link in the show notes. There's a little video there explaining how it works. We're also on social media. So definitely check out our social media. Uh, Facebook, uh, we're big on Facebook. Um, so definitely uh, check that out and send us uh, send us messages on there and, and like the page. We'd appreciate that. Um, also check out our, our YouTube account. Um, Byron's uh, doing a lot on that one and he's uh, reviewing a lot of uh, uh, technique DVDs. So uh, check that out. And uh, we're also on Reddit. We're also on um, – uh, Twitter. So uh, definitely check us out and let your friends know about it. Tell all your friends uh, about uh, the BJJ Brick podcast. Yep. really means a lot when somebody says, hey, I got referred to it by a friend and I've really enjoyed the podcast. And that kind of an email really is very encouraging uh, to us over here as we're making this podcast. Next week, Gary, my man, we've got clean. What do we got next week? Clean. We're getting- Although- you Otherwise, clean? yep. <laughs> Otherwise known as Dustin Dennis, uh, very few people have done something that he's done. He choked out Marcelo Garcia uh, in a competition. That rear naked choke. So uh, that's not as you know, like that, that's really in the past. He's a very motivational person. He doesn't like to use that word, but he's very inspiring. He'll push you. He'll get you to to train harder. He'll really get you to be your best. 
and uh, just recently had the interview with him. I'm getting it edited and ready for next week. Uh, awesome interview. I had a chance to meet Dustin a few uh, about a month or two ago, and just blown away by uh, the seminar he puts on, the level of uh, training intensity that he uh, is able to get out of the room. I'm just really impressed by Dustin, and so. It's going to be a great interview next week, so really, uh, you should be looking forward to that. Look him up online. Watch the videos. Uh, Dustin Dennis, uh, you can look for clean. Or uh, a lot of things he says is like CHOP certified. If you go to chopcertified.com, that's his website. You can find a lot of stuff by him there. But uh, very interesting person. Uh, he's done a lot. He's really helping all the people. So really happy to bring him next week. And if you're in the Wichita area, Gary, what should they do? Definitely send us a message to bjjbrick at gmail.com. Hit us up on our Facebook page. Let us know you'll be in town. We'd love to uh, have a chance to get on the mat and, uh, and have a friendly roll. Absolutely. As always, stay sweaty, my friends. And always make sure you get 1% better. Thank you for listening. I hope you find the time today to roll. After all, the best way to get better at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Here's a little bit extra, my friends. While Gary and I were recording this episode, for some reason or another, Gary bumped his computer or his mouse, and he started calling somebody on our Skype call. He added a third person. And uh, it added a bit of confusion because neither one of us really knew what was going on. So here that is. Even just send us an email. So we really appreciate it. So thank you guys very much. Absolutely. It, uh, it's very nice having uh, kind of like a, a team. Hold on a second. Are, you, are we calling What's, Brian? What the heck happened? We're calling somebody named Brian. Oh, uh, hey, how do we get rid of him? Brian? Do you know Brian? I do. I must have hit something. <laughs> Let's hang up. And... <laughs> okay, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny, Gary. Oh, that was weird, Gary. That was kind of tense. I must have hit it. I wonder what I did. It said he was not online on my side. <laughs> oh, he's going to... That'd be weird to just randomly call somebody every show and see... Uh... <laughs> we got to just put him on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. We need to do that. <laughs> I heard it made like a funny sound like bleep. I'm like, what is that Me too. I was mean? like, I thought I hung up on you or something. Yeah, I look and at it and this thing says, I know, yeah. I see a picture of Brian on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, crap. Did I call Brian? <sighs> well, Gary, oh, maybe next time that our, our random phone call will be a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man.